Just pop the champagne bottles now. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here is what we're watching this morning. The final trading day of 2023 is here, folks. All three major averages, they're poised for a ninth consecutive weekly win as investors continue to cheer on the market's year-end rally. If the S&P 500 notches another positive week, it would be the longest weekly winning streak for the benchmark average since 2004. And who said investing was easy? All right, Maine is barring former President Donald Trump from the 2024 primary ballot. The state's Democratic Secretary of State has removed him over his actions leading up to the U.S. Capitol riot back in January 2021. Maine now joins Colorado as the second state to ban Trump from the ballot. And Elon Musk takes an L. Musk's ex, formerly known as Twitter, lost a bid to block a California state law on content moderation. Now, the law requires social media companies to publicly reveal how they moderate content on their platforms. Well, what a year it has been. Global shares are on track for their best yearly run since 2019. The S&P 500 sits a feather's throw from its all-time high, looking to extend its annual gain to almost 25%. The Nasdaq rocketing almost 45% and eyeing its best performance for 20 years, fueled by you guessed it, all things AI. And don't sleep on the small caps. The Russell 2000 had a big month in December and could be looking for an even better 2024. It's just been remarkable, the amount of conversation that has really been reinvigorated around some of the small caps and the calls going into 2024. But I think more notably here is how much of the permeation we might be able to see on the AI trade that still continues to thrust itself forward in 2024 as well, seeing as how that has been the story of 2023 or one of them. Them. Right. This is going to be a, what happens to these AI stocks is really going to be a very, very must watch story in 2024. What do you do with a company like NVIDIA shares up over 240 percent this year? Do you continue to buy this stock on this concern or fear that you're missing out on even more gains? Do you sell it on fear that things just can't get any better for this company? So that is one story to watch. But, you know, for this year, some of the things that caught our attention that investors are not necessarily focused on, maybe because they're completely obsessed with all things NVIDIA and Magnificent 7, it's really the, uh, the one, the drop in oil, biggest annual drop since 2020. Oil price is really pulling back here uh, and coming, I think, as a key support to a lot of consumers in this country, also now having to deal with the return of student loan payments. Uh, Brad, you have gold prices headed there for their first annual gain in three years, up 13% on the year. Gold stock's doing pretty well, and the dollar uh, really continues to be under pressure, lifting uh, a lot of profits uh, for those multinational companies. Continued dollar weakness likely to continue to boost those overseas profits in the coming quarters. Yeah, it's a few things. A matter of when rate cuts start to get initiated here, as you're thinking about what the calculus is uh, across firms right now, it, it ranges. And so at the end of the day, some of the hopium in just how many of those cuts, and that'll perhaps be one of the themes that we can discuss later on in the show, how many of those cuts are actually going to come forward. If you ask Goldman Sachs, Jan Hatzius and his team, they're not looking for the Fed to actually lower rates until Q4 2024. So you, you better not uh, kind of just sit back and, and ultimately expect any type of Fed chair, Jay Powell type of massive pivot in the form of cuts to come forward if you're over at Goldman Sachs. However, there, there are some competing thoughts with that. I think there are some calls for as many as six cuts next <laughs> that's year. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Look, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, come on. Well, well no, Mira was looking cuts. for a cut earlier this well, year. Let me tell you, so if, we, if the Fed cuts <laughs> rates six times next year and this economy is in a recession, the stock market is probably down 40% from its highs. I mean, you don't want to see necessarily see the Federal Reserve yeah. out there cutting rates six times. That'd be, no. that'd be dreadful. Well, because it, it says, and it really is foretelling, not even foretelling, Telling, it's acknowledging of the fact that something far worse is actually showing up in this data dependent Fed and what they're actually monitoring and discussing. And it doesn't seem like that that tenor is actually completely off the table even right now. It sounds like they are at least putting that discussion out there at these meetings. By the time the Fed cuts rates uh, six times, Brad, I think NVIDIA will be $1,500 a share. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's my prediction. Okay. All right. All right. I think the street high right now is like $700. Uh, <laughs> All right. Let me, let me get to this next story. And it's a story really that my team here, Yahoo Finds, kind of made fun of me but I'm going to still highlight it anyway. Uh, it has been a dud of a year for lithium. Yes, lithium, a metal often talked about by Elon Musk, the world's richest person on his earnings calls. After hitting record highs in 2022, prices have plunged this year as investors weigh concerns about a slowdown in EV growth. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills has the analysis. And I know, Madison, after your analysis, 
you are not making fun of me about wanting to talk about lithium. I was just going to say, I'm really happy to hear that I get the stories everyone's making fun of in the morning meeting. So thank you for <laughs> alerting to me to that, you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, but in all seriousness here, it is contract signing season for lithium producers. And it's not great news for them, right? This precious metal down 80% year to date. Why is that? Well, it's the classic supply and demand issue. There was a boom in production following the boom in demand that we saw for lithium in 2021. That was due to the EV craze. Now we're seeing too much production, so too much supply, and a lack of demand as EV sales continue to stall. EV sales uh, in the 40% range this year. UBS expecting that to slow to 11% next year. So what is this doing to the stocks in this space as we look year to date here for some of these big producer names? They are also starting to struggle. We're seeing those stocks heading uh, into the red as we head into the end of this year. Now, when we look ahead here, I don't personally think that it's over for lithium. I think that if the EV space can start to create uh, models that are a little bit more affordable, they'll be able to get some more market share, get some more consumers to the table who haven't considered an EV personally. Uh, and that might lead to an increase in demand for EVs that could lead to more interest in lithium moving forward. Uh, I'm looking at one leading indicator. It's a plot of land here in the U.S. Uh, that's about 22 miles wide and it's worth about a trillion dollars because of the amount of lithium underneath the soil there. So if you look at that, it's not looking like lithium is going away anytime soon. Uh, these contracts are looking to go down by about 5 to 10 percent as they close out the year here, but they're still getting signed at similar volumes compared with last year, guys. Maddie, just while we have you, I mean, we were thinking about GM, Ford, Stellantis, all of them that have these EV ambitions and production goals that have started to scale that back because of the breather that we're seeing in demand. How does that translate through to the lithium market and, and where ultimately perhaps is that giving the lithium space more time to get its ducks in a row and perhaps uh, find a bidder for that 22 mile uh, plot of land that you mentioned a moment ago. Well, it's thank you for uh, pointing out my geography background here, Brad, but it's, <laughs> it's critical, right? I mean, if the demand isn't there, if we're hearing news about Ford cutting back on EV production, that's not going to be good for the lithium producers. Also, because of that demand boom that I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of competition in this space. So now you've got more players in the room and you've got less players players coming to the table. And I do want to mention the China piece is critical in this story, as it is with every story we talk about. The lack of a robust return to growth in China that we had anticipated is also leading to some slowdown in the contract sign, particularly when it comes to uh, the Chinese producers that are coming to the table with these lithium producers. Uh, they're not necessarily as invested in getting big contracts, uh, big demand for this coming year, because they just don't need it as much given that slowdown in EV production and demand. Now, Madison, uh, on a slow day, it's good to see you uh, bringing us land plot analysis on lithium. Uh, the team might be made fun of, making fun of this one, but uh, no making fun of your analysis. That is good stuff. Madison Mills, thanks so much. All right, NVIDIA is launching a modified version of its advanced gaming chip that complies with U.S. export controls targeting China. This is the first China-focused chip for the company since the Biden administration put those export rules into effect back in October. NVIDIA currently holds more than 90 percent market share of China's $7 billion AI chip market and is poised to close the year above a trillion dollar market cap for the first time ever. Uh, and Brad, this was this issue with China was a key risk. We just highlighted we, we did our special NVIDIA coverage, what, 12, 48 hours ago, whatever yeah. it was. You can go see that content out there. And there it is. That was our original graphic. And they just put a line right through. It. So that is the uh, ugly being removed off that chart. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean NVIDIA's uh, m upcoming earnings results are going to show significant acceleration in China quarter over quarter uh, because of this uh, issue. It will probably take a couple quarters before those China results to stabilize. But again, good to see NVIDIA, uh, good for NVIDIA to be addressing this. And I think another issue or another thing why uh, this will feed into the uh, NVIDIA bull narrative. Yeah, this is absolutely massive. You think about the international ambitions and really retaining some of those customers internationally. That, that is key for NVIDIA and for investors to see in terms of the margin growth expectations at this point. The second we see any type of deceleration in that margin growth as tied to the AI part of its chip business here and uh, for everything that we've heard over the course of the year for GDX Cloud and what that's going to mean for NVIDIA in the future, it could still signal to investors that deceleration, if they were to see that in the margin growth side, that all right, now 
we must take some profits. Now we must reassess what an actual multiple looks like going forward from here. And so I think it's great that NVIDIA has been able to very diligently and more so than the rest of the market, get ahead of how everyone else is thinking about artificial intelligence and put that at the top of investors' minds, both early in the year in Q1 and now once again, essentially, to wrap up the year in Q4. And I don't want to sound, I don't want to make us sound like we're uh, NVIDIA uh, hype wagons here. No. But, and so I want to bring up something by Matt Nally. He will be on the show a little bit later, later on, but Matt's sending his note over to me this morning, noting this, and I think it's very important here, uh, noting that uh, NVIDIA, of course, one of the best performing stocks of the market this year, but uh, pointing out the vast majority of its gains came in the first six and a half months of the year. Since mid-July, uh, NVIDIA's stock is only, quote Matt, uh, only up 4.2%, and really sits at the same level where it did on Labor Day week, and you can see that really come to life in that Yahoo Finance chart right there. Uh, perhaps the market really waiting to be blown away again on all things NVIDIA. It's just a Goldilocks situation that they have to deliver upon quarter after quarter now or with any announcement that they put forward. And so some of the risk, let's not entirely take the China risk off the table because one of the other elements that we had talked about with NVIDIA earlier this week was the fact that if they're going to continue selling into China, then they perhaps have some exposure in a general election year next year as there's going to be so much vitriolic talk about which companies are selling into which regions how they're able to satisfy all parties involved. And uh, I think that's going to be perhaps one of the larger political punching bags, especially given the chips front and the importance of the Biden administration kind of placing more spending on that too recently. Yeah, uh, right on, Brian. Of course, that $500 level on NVIDIA, the upside resistance point. But let's get back on politics here. Uh, Maine is now the second state to bar former President Donald Trump from its ballot in next year's U.S. presidential primary election. Maine's Secretary of State concluded that Trump in incited an insurrection. The decision comes after a group of former Maine lawmakers claim that Trump should be barred based on a provision of the Constitution that disqualifies people from holding office if they engaged in insurrection or rebellion. Could this snowball from here? We have Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman with analysis on this one. Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, so to the question of will this snowball, I think it all depends on uh, what the Supreme Court says about these challenges to Trump. Uh, so the Colorado case that we heard from early, uh, earlier this month, uh, the, the Supreme Court there said, yes, the state can bar Trump from the primary elections there. The Republican Party has appealed that to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has not yet said whether it will take that, but let's assume that it does. The Supreme Court is going to issue the final word here. And, I, and if the Supreme Court says flatly uh, and widely that, no, states simply cannot um, bar Donald Trump, uh, given that he has not been convicted yet of anything that sounds like insurrection, um, then I think that that would settle it and he would um, he would stay on the ballot in both the primary and the general election in all states. However, who knows what the Supreme Court is going to do? Um, three of the uh, three of the nine uh, Supreme Court justices are Trump appointees. Uh, so I guess some people think that Trump has at least those three votes in his pocket, plus also probably Clarence Thomas. But I'm not sure that's true. Uh, just be, just because Trump appointed those uh, conservative justices does not mean that they're his buddies and they're just going to do whatever he wants. And the Supreme Court could do a whole range of things. They could say he states can bar him under certain conditions, which would which would be a complete can of worms because every state is different here. Every state constitution is different. Every state has different rules for who's allowed on the ballot. So there really are 50 different permutations of how this could go. And then you have the primary election and the general election. So we need we, we, we need clarity from the Supreme Court on this, and probably the sooner the better, especially for the primaries, because uh, many of the states, I mean, most of them actually, they need to get their primary ballots printed within the next uh, week or two, depending on when the election is. So this needs to get settled soon. Rick, thanks so much for setting up this conversation. We're going to continue this discussion. Two states, Colorado and now Maine, have moved to try to disqualify former President Donald Trump from their primary election ballots. As of right now, Trump is back on the ballot in Colorado as an appeal has been filed by the state's Republican Party. The Trump campaign says it plans to appeal in Maine as well. So what are the next steps from here? We have Howard Dean. He is the former governor of Vermont, as well as the former chair of the DNC, and Steve Clements, Semaphore founding editor at large. Great to have you both here with us today, and especially on this topic. You know, Howard, I want to begin with you, especially considering how massive a move this is for the states that have initiated such action. What is the next step? I mean, Rick just talked about how quickly some of these ballots need to even begin to be printed as well. 
I think Rich is right. It's going to end up at the Supreme Court. The problem is the Supreme Court essentially is corrupt. Uh, they are, have been appointed to fit certain criteria by a very influential group of uh, gazillionaires called the Federalist Society. Two of them are actually have actually taken money from people and then, then sat, sat in, on cases. So while the court legally probably has the final jurisdiction, I think most Americans are no longer confident in the Supreme Court's ability to carry out its role as a result of the shenanigans that have gone on uh, for the past uh, 20 years. Um, so I, I don't know how this ends up. Uh, the, the, uh, this article has never been tried before. Uh, I think logically the Supreme Court is the place for it to go. It's unfortunate that we no longer have a court system in this country where most Americans can have confidence in it. Steve, let me uh, get over to you. What does this mean, you know, as these challenges and issues continue to mount, what does this mean for the big money supporting various candidates or challengers to the former president? Well, I think it gives them a small, tiny, um, you know, a sliver of hope that that perhaps Donald Trump, who is the 900-pound gorilla in in the you know Republican primary race, uh, could be disqualified. I mean, you you could set it up. I think Rick Newman laid it out. I think quite beautifully uh, in terms of what the possibilities were. But but Howard Dean laid out what the likelihood is. And the likelihood is there'll be uh, no impact on Donald Trump's candidacy. Uh, for the GOP primary, and it will make, you know, likely uh, no impact on Donald Trump appearing on these ballots. And even if it were to somehow be sustained in a couple of these ballots, uh, it's it's not enough to make a difference. So I hate to be the realist here, but that is that is where you see things at the moment. So big money behind Chris Christie, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis. You know, I think that they're that the money that's behind them now is there for other reasons. The reasons are that they fundamentally don't want to see a return of uh, President Trump to that ticket. Um, and I don't expect that these rulings one way or another are going to matter for them. Even for a party, Steve, that was trying to best figure out how to, if necessary, distance itself or move on from Trump, does this just kind of put lighter fluid on the clear path ahead for him as the nominee for the party? But you need to realize the party itself, however you measure that, doesn't want to abandon Trump. You look at Donald Trump's numbers out there, and they're astoundingly large. There is a portion of the GOP that wants to move beyond Trump and move to other candidates and have a genuine contest. I think the same thing is true, honestly, in the Democratic campaign with, with President Biden, who would like to see um, alternatives to the Biden-Harris ticket. But But right now, you know, as things look today, unless Donald Trump does something to himself to self implode, um, it, it doesn't look as if there is a likely real challenger to Donald Trump. We'll have to see what happens with New Hampshire. Nikki Haley, until her, um, at, you know, uh, mistake of not mentioning slavery as the principal driver, driver of the Civil War, uh, you know, depending on how that plays out in New Hampshire, there's really not a challenger to, to take on Donald Trump within the party. The party does not want to abandon him right now. Howard, let me, uh, let me get back to you. So we have these um, headlines regarding the former president, uh, but when you look at the Biden administration, it looks like they should have a couple wins or, or just win behind their sales a little bit besides this one. Inflation is coming down this country. You have stocks trading at a record. Consumers are out there spending. What should the Biden administration be doing right now? They, look, if you, I, I'm, I don't have a particularly close relationship with Biden as I have with many other Democratic presidents just because our paths haven't intersected much. But if you, you got to hand it to him, the guy's probably done a better job than any president and domestically since uh, Lyndon Johnson. The stuff he's delivered is incredible. Climate change, uh, the minimum wage stuff, helping students. The big problem we have here is a generation gap. Uh, the truth is Trump has been incredibly fortunate because he's so bombastic and great at playing, you know, watch the shiny object. He's, he's almost as old as Biden. And the generations uh, Z and the millennials really would much rather have somebody who's 40. Uh, and so we've got two candidates, one of whom has a terrific record. The other is, in my opinion, a crackpot. Um, but he's got a terrific ability to magnetize up, up people who are upset and people who aren't doing well and uh, people who are angry. Um, and it's a, it, the country's in a lot of trouble because of this. And this is going to be really come down to turnout. If young people turn out, uh, we get Joe Biden, who's a much better deal for them. 
if they don't turn out, we get Donald Trump. And I think there are a lot of people in the Republican Party and the Republican establishment have understood that that it threatens the existence of the United States of America as a democracy. Is there a, a shadow campaign right now, uh, former governor, that comes to mind that actually would be successful or perhaps even just completely flip the tables on, on the calculus that we've been thinking of this Trump-Biden match, rematch once again in 2024? Um, you know, the only calculus is somebody doesn't run and, and it's not Joe Biden and then we get a great candidate. I think that's wishful thinking. At this point in the campaign, it's going to be Biden most likely versus Trump. I, I, I was frankly hopeful for the country's sake uh, about Haley because I think Haley is a reasonably sane person. I do think she blew herself up in New Hampshire and I, I you know, that's what happens if you just don't have a lot of experience and she doesn't have a lot of experience on the national stage. I can painfully remember blowing myself up a few times when I was running without a lot of national experience. Steve, uh, last one to you. Do you think President Biden uh, runs? He hasn't come out and formally said he will run. I do. I don't, I, I think that President Biden believes deeply that it is a matter of his own personal patriotism for this country that he doesn't feel he can leave the stage to Donald Trump, and he believes that he is the only person uh, that can beat Donald Trump. Whether he's correct or not uh, is is another matter. But I, and I but I do believe that Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and I've talked to many of his senior advisors, feels this deeply, and that's why he's not ready to abandon this role to, you know, the chance that somebody else might be able to come along and, you know, roll a bowling, you know, uh, ball into into Donald Trump's pins, but. But I think that that Joe Biden is in this, and I think unless you know something we can't expect happens, he's in this race. And I agree with Howard Dean; he's likely to um, be the Democratic nominee. Former Governor, former Vermont Governor Howard Dean, and some for Steve Clements. Thank you both. And, and former Governor, let me just say that I, I think people didn't understand your excitement back in the day. We fully understand that now. Uh, so we appreciate it. And well, that, need that, more. that wasn't the only inopportune statement I made, but it has attracted a lot of attention. It, it has indeed. It has indeed. Uh, well, we got Howard the was excited. He was excited. He was excited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, gentlemen. We appreciate it. And, uh, Thank you. Early Happy New Year to you both. Thanks. Elon Musk's ex is facing some legal setbacks in California. X, formerly known as Twitter, lost a bid challenging a state law mandating social media platforms to publicly disclose how they moderate content. The company tried overturning the law back in September of this year. Well, Brad, yeah, this one is really is an interesting one to, uh, to watch from the standpoint is, first, does this, stabilize, does this platform stabilize at some point next year? And if it does, do advertising dollars finally start to come back into uh, the likes of Twitter slash X? Because a lot of studies right now, a lot of resource that is hitting into year end suggests a lot of ad dollars are flowing into LinkedIn, Meta, Instagram, you name it. And why is this important for Musk to get these dollars back? Because he can't be distracted anymore. I think it's very important for him to stay focused on delivering uh, what he needs to deliver at Tesla, uh, because that what that stake in Tesla, that value in Tesla, essentially drives uh, whatever he does, whether it's SpaceX, X, you name it. Here, the money is not going to flow back in droves, and here's why: when I mean, you've got a replay video that any CEO or investor or perhaps not even investor, any marketer or advertiser who's overseeing millions of dollars in ad campaigns that get spent on social media. You look at X, you look at the platform, you say it is a cesspool of some of the worst thoughts and perpetuation of just slander um, that has started to really unfold under Musk's leadership. And, and I use leadership very kind of liberally in this because at this end of the day, anytime you have a CEO or a head of a company, a holding company that has Twitter underneath of it, telling its customers to go F themselves, who is going to, you, I mean, there's there's an old book out there um, that uh, it's, I believe it's titled Hug Your Customer or something like that. Um, this is the exact opposite of hugging your customer. This is telling your customer that, hey, if you're going to try and move your dollars away from me for one reason or another because you don't agree with me, well, then you know what? I don't need you. Turns out you actually do at the end of the day. And I think for other companies that are going to be able to capitalize on that, you mentioned LinkedIn, subsidiary of Microsoft. We can also think about Snapchat or Pinterest, two of the other names that perhaps could see even more of that time spent going to their platform and also some of those ad dollars as well. One thing to watch. I think going into next year, Brad, uh, is if 
uh, ex-CEO Linda Yaccarino actually survives the year. Now, this is, Linda is an incredibly accomplished industry executive with very deep contacts and deep uh, knowledge of her industry. At what point does she just have enough of Musk and decides this is not where she wants to spend the next year, two, three years of her life and her career? Because if she does, you know, she may not have it. She, it hurts her reputation yeah. tremendously in all the many years she has put into crafting her space in this industry. 100% agree. All right, uh, we'll leave it there for right now. Uh, much more action in, in the markets, much more analysis we'll have for you here at Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back. The high probability of a shallow recession makes corporate credit and specifically high yield bonds more valuable. That's according to Alliance Bernstein. This comes after the world's debt market is set to reach its biggest two month gain ever. That's thanks to traders optimism in central banks cutting interest rates. Debt markets are not the only winners. The Nasdaq 100 is nearing its best year since 1999 and the S&P is close to hitting a record high. Consumer resilience in the U.S. has also played a huge role in boosting sentiment. I, I would say it's played an outsized role in how the Fed is calculating the entire situation right now. They have completely and entirely, to their own admission, underestimated the strength of household and, and even small business balance sheets. Brad, you're not going to sit here and make me talk about high-yield debt on the last day of the year. Or corporate you know, credit. Do I have to do it? There are curveballs exist out here in All this right, world. I'm going to throw a little curveball here. I'm going to cue in really <laughs> on what you mentioned about consumer resilience. Really good note by the team over at uh, Goldman Sachs looking at some things happening in the consumer land that maybe you didn't realize. They're calling out for 2024, Brad, 
Interest income will also likely rise meaningfully next year and should support consumer spending. Now, why will it rise meaningfully? Of course, a lot of consumers, a lot of households this year invested in things like CDs, high yielding assets. Uh, maybe it's high yielding debt, whatever it is, uh, and consumers out there potentially spending because of this savings. You, my friend, are saved by the bell here as we're taking a look at the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange and at the NASDAQ where You've got a good look at the bell ringers. They're on the podium and on the stage at the NASDAQ. <laughs> the bell ringers. And some, some funfetti. I, I just can't see <laughs> what, I mean, it looks like one of them is hockey for sure. That's great. Love that, sports. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the other is the Times Square Alliance. They usually ring the opening bell over at the NASDAQ ahead of the first trading day of the new year as well. I dig it. Wow. I mean, is that some red? There was some brief red on the screen. I think Brad. we were I just calibrating. Stocks just trading yeah. records every single day. Well, it can here today. And uh, we're within a feather's throw, as we wrote in our script earlier on this morning, of some new hotel. Well, I wrote highs. that down. That was a good one. I, yeah? like that. I, like that. I, I gave that one to our, uh, our executive producer, Alex. Good man there. All right. Well, taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, flat but barely to the upside here by the hair of our chinny chin chin. We'll see if we can hold on to these gains. Uh, we've got Jared Blickery and Madison Mills standing by here. Let's discuss this just a little bit further here as we're, Maddie, opening up the trading session here. And ultimately, I think a lot of investors are just going to be wondering how this year is going to close out. Will we finally see that all-time high? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that we're seeing some green on the screen here. If I don't get to break the S&P 500 news today, I'm going to be so <laughs> upset. Please, I'm More lithium, you. please. More lithium. More lithium. More lithium. Find the movement wherever you can, guys. Uh, and, and traders across the street are looking into some weird corners of this market to squeeze some final juice out before the end of this year. I was just looking yesterday at the top performing stocks. We've got Match Group, number one, followed by AMD at number two. Uh, Nike's in there, so maybe saying, okay, this stock has not not done so well the past couple of weeks. Let's get in while it's cheap, and maybe they'll have a comeback heading into next year. Uh, Tesla, the worst performing stock yesterday. So uh, just interesting to see where these consumers, where these investors rather, are starting to try and seek out some value as we head into the end of this year. Uh, also, gains begetting gains, as we've heard from all of our guests, right? So the S&P 500 double-digit gains this year. We're likely going to see double-digit gains heading into next year. And guys, let's not forget from your last guests, it's a election year. So we are likely to see gains in an election year as well. Uh, historically, you always see gains in the S&P in an election year. That's happened about 89% of the time in an election year, particularly when a sitting president is running. All right, Madison, uh, real good stuff. Uh, let's continue this uh, market look. Let's go with Jared Blickery at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Jared. Well, we're not looking at, at a whole lot of action here. The Dow up two basis points, S&P 500 up one, NASDAQ up five. This is typically the time of year that we, uh, we uh, for lack of a better term, we're watching paint dry. But that doesn't mean that if there's nothing going on, we can prepare for the next year. And in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be taking a look at some of those laggards like uh, Moderna, Peloton, Etsy that just didn't come back this year yet. Uh, we got a couple days left, don't wanna throw that out. But uh, XLK, tech is a leading sector today, followed by healthcare, financials, industrials, just barely in the green there. Real estate and utilities, uh, those have been some leading sectors recently, but those are the laggards today. Uh, that's on the back of lower interest rates. And let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100. Uh, kind of a mixed board and not seeing too much dark green or dark red, just uh, NVIDIA up eight tenths of a percent, Apple and Microsoft up a quarter of a percent, Tesla down 17 basis points there. Let's take a look at our leaderboard. And it's been interesting this week. M J, that's cannabis ETF, that has been bouncing back, but this is one of those laggards for the entire year that I just don't have a lot of confidence in. It only turned up just a little bit in November. You look at some other charts, they just rocketed out of here. Uh, but for what it's worth, uh, we do have cannabis leading today, uh, followed by KWeb. Those are Chinese internet stocks. To the downside, we got solar, looks like Korean stocks and regional banks and internet stocks in the US. Those are rounding out the bottom. But again, not seeing too much movement uh, energy has been a leading sector here for most of the morning, even pre-market. Exxon Mobil not doing much. Chevron down uh, two tenths of a percent. Uh, Total up about 86 basis points. And let's check in on some meme stocks. I'm going to be looking at these in the next hour. Uh, but you can see more red than green here. Coinbase, Coinbase down four tenths of a percent. Palantir down 11 basis points. And uh, let's just skip over to crypto, see if we can find anything moving there. Bitcoin up 24 basis points, but the real headline here, Bitcoin up 157.8% for the year. Uh, one year ago, we were dealing with the FTX bankruptcy. It was maybe one and a half months in for that, and uh, this was not on the radar, I can tell you that.
All right, Jared, I, wish, I will uh, note as well our uh, Madison Mills flagging uh, new record highs for Lululemon, TJ Maxx, and Hilton. Very interesting to see Lulu shares hit a record high against a lower end or a lower uh, play on the consumer, lower end play on the consumer like TJ Maxx. Fascinating uh, moves there uh, in those names. And Hilton really continue to benefit from the ongoing travel recovery. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. All right, 2023 was the year of AI for investors, and it's not showing signs of slowing down in 2024. Our next guest thinks we'll see widespread adoption of Gen AI, but there will be some major headwinds for investors to consider. Macquarie head of US AI software research, Fred Havemeyer, is here to get you into the right trades. Fred, so all morning long, we're, we're sitting here, really all week long, I should say, really talking about all things NVIDIA, what might be in store for them. But you're here to say, I think there are other names besides NVIDIA investors should be looking at. What are those names? Yeah, thank you. Um, we put together a basket of names that we think provide exposure to the theme of generative AI just across a number of different sectors of software. Because even on our end, like we thought for a while that Microsoft was one of her primary names to find exposure to uh, significant and we think profitable generative AI growth. So we put together a basket of uh, stocks that we believe have solid exposure to generative AI, either directly or indirectly. And that includes, of course, Microsoft, ServiceNow, CrowdStrike, MongoDB, HubSpot, Salesforce, and PowerSchool. So we're looking at names all up and down the value chain here. We're looking at companies that we think will be monetizing uh, products built with generative AI directly, like your ServiceNows, your Salesforce's, HubSpot, even PowerSchool, as well as those that are in the pick and shovel side of things, like MongoDB on the database uh, side. And those that are exposed, we think, to um, what will be uh, trends that are supportive of cybersecurity adoption related to generative AI with a CrowdStrike pick. So you think about some of the largest forces that have driven even investors' attention towards cybersecurity, AI, over the course of this year. What type of long tail are you seeing on those trades? I think that this year was the year that we started seeing in 2023. It was the rise of ChatGPT. We all now suddenly know and can see a really commercialized use case that became extremely popular among consumers and even businesses of generative AI. Uh, I think going into 2024 and beyond, I believe that in 2024, we're going to begin to see the first really significant and material signs of enterprise adoption of generative AI, that going into also calendar year of 2025, I think we'll be seeing really significant uh, adoption trends occurring. I think with now products like Microsoft 365 Copilot rolling out, uh, enterprises will actually have the opportunity to adopt and purchase these products, which were not previously available except on early access bases. So going into 2024, we're finally going to see pricing emerge for many of these products. And as a result, and on the other side of this, I think we're going to see a significant trend of adoption on enterprise generative AI. We're starting to see it with ServiceNow. We're certainly seeing it with Microsoft. And as companies roll out more products, Looking forward to seeing how the pricing and competition emerges, but I think 2024 is going to be the year of enterprise adoption of generative AI. Fred, you wrote something very important in the note you sent to us, and it was this. Software valuations are back to 2019 peaks with AI enthusiasm uh, and the market pricing in a Fed pivot. Are some of these AI trades set up for failure in January and February as earnings start to come in and maybe just don't meet the inflated expectations investors have? So looking into this next year, thank you for, for reading that. I'm very glad that the message is coming across because we do think that it is actually a point of a potential uh, volatility going into this next year, that we're back at a level where software valuations have reapproached the peaks we saw in 2019. Now we're not looking at the COVID uh, pandemic era uh, inflated valuations during the zero interest rate, uh, interest rate environment. But when we're comparing this historically, we certainly see that we are pricing in uh, a lot of future growth here. So we would not be surprised if at the start of the year, many companies in the software universe guide at or under expectations, considering that it looks like 2024 is uh, has a similar setup as 2023 in terms of companies' ability to sell in a macro environment that's characterized, of course, by now two hot kinetic wars, uh, in addition to rising geopolitical risks and uh, um, certainly everything that's going on in the interest rate environment. So as we look into 2024, um, I think that there's going to be certainly volatility, and I think that also offers opportunity that if there are any sort of uh, macro missteps or any sort of issues with the optics of initial guidance uh, causing stocks to trade off, then I think that could be offering a new opportunity here to step into names that 
are very solid long-term picks. Now, I don't have anything that I think is going to miss here, but I do think that any volatility is providing an entry point into high-quality names. Yeah. Fred, I, I just think about the pricing power for some of these companies as they're putting these products and solutions out into the market. For the companies that have already come out in this most recent quarter of earnings results and said they're, they're going to be exercising more cost discipline going into next year, how does that then impact the pricing power for purchasers or, or for rather the companies who are providing these solutions as they're continuing to try and look across their portfolio of clients and try to figure out where they can upsell them? Well, I think going into this next year, um, software companies have had, I believe, consistent pricing power. And I think as long as these generative AI tools are delivering a solution or a set of solutions that provide companies with greater efficiency and a return on their investment, I think that the pricing will naturally emerge. And I think that companies will have an opportunity in the software landscape to either price this on a per user basis as we're seeing with Microsoft with 365 Copilot, or potentially to maybe adopt like a hybrid pricing where you hmm. might have some level of uh, per user pricing for generative AI tools, in addition to some variable pricing or usage-based pricing component which could let these companies both manage their margin and capture more upside if customers are finding substantial value. I think going into this next year though, as pricing for generative AI products emerge, um, I'm not so worried that the companies will not have pricing power, but I do think it will require monitoring and, and a, a, a careful watch of the market to see how the pricing competition actually emerges. Because prior to like uh, in 2023, Essentially, the two products available for enterprise use in the entire generative AI market um, that are being commercialized have been ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot. Going into 2024, we're going to have those two, of course, Microsoft 365 Copilot, and then all the products and services that are pending launch in 2024 that have been in early access programs. So I think we'll have a period of price discovery, and um, I'm, I'm very eager to see how that plays out. Fred, we are too. Appreciate it here. Fred Havenmeyer, who is the Macquarie Head of U.S. AI Software Research. Fred, Happy New Year to you. Hey, Happy New Year. Thank you. All right. Thanks. We're also watching lift shares this morning after getting hit with a downgrade by Nomura from neutral to reduce, saying the company's driver operating expenses is outpacing its earnings growth. The filing from December 28th also showed that Lyft's chief accounting officer had sold over 18,000 shares of the company's stock here. And so this one downgrade that we had seen for Lyft, you were pointing out the, the valuations of these companies. I mean, it's just so bifurcated and, and has just absolutely detangled from one another between Lyft and Uber. Brad, this is shocking, the valuation disparity between uh, Lyft and Uber here, and really is reflective of one chief thing. Uh, this has been the year, uh, really the second year of Uber's comeback story. Uh, and to drive that comeback story, they have had to really grab massive market share from Lyft, and they have. Uh, and that has Lyft really on its back feet trying to figure out what it does next. And I think that is, you can see just the valuation disparity between these two companies there. It's just clearly separated. Uber has really widened its advantage versus uh, Lyft in, in many, many ways. But that is really at the heart of this Nomura downgrade yeah. uh, on the company concern. Well, how does it regain or jumpstart or reaccelerate, whatever pun you want to call it, how they reaccelerate their top line when Uber increasingly is becoming more dominant essentially every single day. And then secondarily, uh, whenever you see, a, a note for all investors out there, just make this note and save it and tuck it away. Whenever you see the chief accounting officer, which is also who is also in this case the interim CFO, sells shares uh, into year end, not a great sign. Just, just not a great sign, brother. Yeah, no, not indeed. I mean, the core kind of differentiator that Uber was really able to uh, excel in as of right now and continue to invest in is the value in convenience. And I think that's something that they've made a big bet on, whether that be in delivery of just a package and you tossing a package in the trunk of somebody's Uber and they're able to take that somewhere, or you just being able to get from point A to point B. And then at the end of the day, the big investments that they have made in food delivery as well. And that value in convenience that they've placed, uh, I think has had a resounding effect on how they're able to really um, kind of securitize their market share. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that too. I, I don't. It's unclear what the end game is for Lyft. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've talked to the, uh, the new CEO several times, and I don't think he's inclined to to try to uh, shop the business or sell the business. But where else does this live? 
and, and I think the market is trying to figure all of those things out. But let's stay on autos here. Fisco, sh Fisco shares surging this morning. The EV maker announcing it plans on accelerating sales and deliveries in January. Uh, the company increasing the number of test drive events in both the U.S. and Europe. Fisco delivered a total of about 4,700 EVs, which is more than 300% increase from the third quarter to the fourth quarter. Uh, and look, Brad, this stock has been absolutely hammered. Sure, I had some good news into your end for Fisker, but this is an under $2 stock right now, uh, and it's under $2 for a reason. They have had production problems. Uh, they've had, I would say, demand problems, despite what this press release is saying today. And oh yeah, Fisker is going up against a giant beast. Uh, beast, I should say, in Tesla, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, you name it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you take a look at the shares. This was a company that won public via SPAC. So ultimately, as part of that de-SPAC process, you, call, you saw them come public at what was the common price usually uh, for the SPAC of, of $10 that was put forward. But even after Fisker went public, struggling to get back to or even maintain anywhere near that ether of that $10 price, which is really just kind of a placeholder before the D-SPAC. It's been a, I think for this week, a loud, quiet week for Fisker. It's a quiet week in the market. It's not a ton of news coming out. Fisker trying to make waves, talking about the first ocean sport delivery that happened. They also revamped their loyalty program. And then you get this business update today, which sends shares higher. But then again, as you were mentioning, on what base? The base right now, so low that you see a jump like this take place. And it's still a larger question of how do they continue to take share when production is still one of the larger concerns that investors have to think about, at least. This is stock uh, Yahoo Finance community loves. Why? Because it's under $2. They view it as cheap. But another investing lesson for today is just because the stock is under $5 doesn't make it cheap, uh, as you can see in that Fisker chart right there. The key question you have to ask yourself, if you're stepping in here and you're thinking this stock is cheap and you're buying Fisker, well, how does it get back to $5? How does it get to $10? And Brad, it's hard to get, you know, chart a path to those positions uh, when you're going up against a Tesla, a company like Tesla that's better capitalized, same deal for Ford, same deal for General Motors. Especially when you just, in 2023, became a revenue-generating company. For that's a, a good point indeed. All right, much more Mark analysis straight ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning, Wall Street. Straight from Yahoo Finance's front page to your mobile phones and to your streaming apps. Watch our new flagship show, The Morning Brief. Your first stop as we guide you through the day's market action. We give you insights into the latest market moving news. Real time analysis of today's top stories. And actionable information about your investments. We bring you the opening bell on Wall Street. And don't miss our strategy sessions with Wall Street's top analysts. It's The Morning Brief. It's The Morning Brief. The Morning Brief. Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief, empowering you to make smart investing decisions. Tune in daily at 9 a.m. Eastern.
This week, Boeing is warning airlines of a potential loose bolt on its 737 MAX planes. The aerospace company is saying it might take only two hours to fix, but this comes after production issues slashed the plane's delivery forecast this year. Our next guest doubts that Boeing will meet its delivery targets in 2024 and other supply issues will continue to plague the company. For more on this, we've got Peter McNally, Third Bridge Global Sector Lead here with us on the day. Peter, it's great to speak with you. I'd love to get your insights around this because if you're a a purchaser of Boeing 737 MAX planes, and, and they have just come off of a stretch of a few months where they've seen a good amount of orders come through both internationally and domestic airline operators too. All that considered, do you look at news like this and say ultimately, okay, that would deter us from exercising the options that they have later on down the line to take even more delivery? Well, I think the bigger issues were a few years ago with the 737 MAX and the, the accidents and the disasters Certainly. that they did happen. This could be a limited, you know, issue. But, look, it's a single aisle plane. They compete with Airbus's 321, you know, and it, it's the workhorse for leisure travel. So it's unlikely, I think, at this point, based on what we know, that there's any kind of impact on, on, on the order book or anyone exercising orders, because it's difficult to get a plane these days. And as supply chains have been stretched, and you know, I think we've seen that post-pandemic, people really do want to travel, and they want to travel by air. And you know, that has made a, a tremendous comeback, and airlines have invested in, in a lot of future capacity. Right, Peter, I, and I think you make a great point in that much of the, and we were giving Boeing credit for this the other day too, much of the pattern of negligence that existed under former CEO Dennis Millenberg, now under Dave Calhoun instead, a lot of that's been erased. They've been able to get back into favor with many of their airline operator purchasers. So for Boeing, which has seen the stock climb over the course of this year on some of those new orders, is... Is this a company that's back in good favor with many of the operators? And now, how do they position themselves against the A321neo that really is kind of that, that kind of head-to-head -head matchup, if you will, on the 737 MAX side? Well, there's a, there's a few things to you know un unpack there. I think customers do have a lot more confidence in this management team, but you know, there are a lot of growth expectations and, and deliveries have been an issue. It can create some some amount of frustration. United Airlines, let's say, in particular, have been particularly aggressive two and a half years ago in ordering planes. They expected a lot, you know, a lot more than they got this year, but they still got a lot. Um, and that's expected to grow in the future. But the, the, the constraints really are there on the uh, on their on Boeing suppliers at this point. Now, as far as you know, competition with, with Airbus, I mean, it, Boeing has lost ground. It's hard to see, talking to our experts at Third Bridge, how they're able to really make those big recoveries with lost customers. You know, in, in Asia in particular, hmm. uh, you know, which is going to be a growth market for, the, for this industry, Airbus dominates you know, orders. And it's a lot of the supply chain is trained, pilots are trained, and it's going to be a lot more difficult for Airbus to make ground, or I'm sorry, for Boeing to gain ground. Now that said, in, in the developed world, Europe and, and the US, Boeing does great. And we would expect, you know, Boeing's uh, 737 MAX to continue to serve those leisure travel clients. Peter, how do you think uh, the defense side of Boeing's business fares in a presidential election year? Well, we've seen just, you know, in general, everything rising. Um, you know, spending is up, uh, deliveries are up. But again, it's a supply chain issue that, you know, we've seen across this industry as well as the commercial aerospace business. So it'll be, you know, interesting to see this development with United Launch Alliance, which has, you know, been rumored for sale uh, for more than, you know, $2 billion is something that uh, Boeing may look to monetize here with their partner. But, um, it's certainly going to be a growth area, but whether or not they can convert that into profit remains to be seen. Uh, along that line, along those lines, Pierre, do you see Boeing meeting its six billion dollar free cash flow goal? It comes down to the seven eighty seven, really, and that has been the big factor in cash flow for the last year and a half, and that certainly is possible now. Uh, there really were some very positive developments in the second half of this year in terms of their ability to 
deliver that plane, which is at a much, much bigger ticket, you know, item than than the 737. So that will go a long way. And I think that's what uh, investors are expecting that they can convert that uh, those deliveries in, into cash flow. How many 787s would they need to deliver? And what's the target from your perspective? Oh, boy. I mean, you know, you're only talking There's nowhere near, let's say, the the expectations, which are a few dozen a month for uh, for the 737s. You know, you're talking at a much lower, like single digit to 10 or 12 a month that uh, the 787s would need to be delivered at, uh, you know, for Boeing. All right, Peter McNally, Third Bridge Global Sector League. Good to see you. Happy New Year. We'll talk to you soon. All right, same to you guys. All right, we'll be right back here on Yahoo Finance. In our latest episode of our new show, Lead This Way, I got a chance to sit down with Beyond Meat founder and CEO Ethan Brown to discuss how he's staying centered throughout the stock's steep drop-off. We're trying to do something that is not going to happen overnight, um, that has fits and starts. We're going to, going to make this thing uh, into the, the long-term success that we've been after. I would be dishonest if I said it hasn't been difficult. You know, there have been challenges, um, but there's been more reward than there have been challenges. There's been more opportunity to impact change uh, than not. 
And Brad, as part of this, uh, this interview, I, I got to spend uh, really the whole day with Ethan and his team in their new headquarters out in El Segundo, which is interesting, right across from uh, the, the street from uh, Mattel's headquarters. But nonetheless, uh, I've known Ethan for about five years, and I didn't get the sense that he was uh, deterred uh, by his mission to change the, the meat industry. Of course, there's Ethan Brown right, uh, right there uh, on the screen. I think he remains laser focused on bringing more innovative products to market, remains laser focused on getting more deals with the likes of McDonald's, some of the fast food players, and then laser focused on getting the prices of his products down to a point where consumers don't have to necessarily grab for a cheaper alternative in, in meat. Uh, to me, he seems like the same guy I met him. Now, is he happy with how the stock price is fair? Well, of course not. This is a company that burst onto the radar screen May 5th, 2019 with its IPO over, the, over at the NASDAQ. The IPO price was $25. The first trade for Beyond Meat was 46 and then it surged to $65.75 a share uh, by the close of trading. Uh, that's 163% gain. So the stock has fallen way back. The results have not been where they, uh, where they should be. Uh, consumers have questioned the, the health of Beyond Meat products, and then, of course, questioned the health of Impossible Foods. It's not just a Beyond Meat thing. So I think for next year, now that they have reset the cost structure, they have had two rounds of pretty big, sizable layoffs. They have reset the cost structure. Uh, they brought the price, pro price points down on these products. Is 2024 the year where the top line stabilizes, the bottom lines, uh, the cost structure is in better shape, and then you finally start to get some better results from Beyond Meat. I think that's what a lot of bulls in this story are hoping for. Yeah, it comes back to a few things, and you mentioned many of them kind of linking about the consumer, where that perhaps appetite needs to change more notably. I mean, you still have a consumer environment. One of the things that's going to be an overhang for Beyond Meat is just how much people are actually eating. We've talked about, of course, the company of the year this year for Yahoo Finance, Nova Nordisk, and you think about some of the underlying stories that have really prompted so much attention towards the healthcare space. It's really been the weight loss drugs at this point in time. And so if you have less of a portion of people that are eating out there or people who are eating far less, that impacts directly a company like Beyond Meat and the potential orders that they could see both on the wholesale side as well as into some of the restauranters that they also have partnerships with. So two-pronged business where you think about the retail but also on the food service side. And then additionally, the scaling that they've had to do over that point in time too. This is a company that used to have so much of their production in different factories or different operational facilities that they did not own, they decided to pivot, they decided to make sure that they could grow those out themselves, break ground and be able to hold on to more of that production capacity and make it something that was just their own entity where they weren't leasing space, but they owned the space. And so that was a strategic decision. This is also a just a story, I think, of needing cash and having to tap the market for more of that. And that's where you've seen some of the share price impacts, most notably over that long-term chart, is because they had to go back to the market and do at the market equity offerings as well. And so the listing of additional shares, that's what impacted them back in 2019. That continued to impact them later on because of the dilution that took place. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I just I think Ethan has been very consistent. We have talked in the past that he he needs and he wants to get the price points of these products down, and he has to continue to do that. And in order to do that, you just have to make more of them because the demand is there. So he has to get those price points down, where this becomes more of a mass market option, where that family of four that remains uh, that is on a very tight budget reaches for Beyond Meat products, whether it's meatballs, sausage, or hamburgers, whatever it is, reach for this instead of a four or six pack of, of traditional meat products. All right. Well, we'll see. And great conversation there with Ethan. Also, everyone, we've got much more markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Good morning, everyone. We've struck the top of the 10 a.m. hour here. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. 37-ish minutes into the trading session here, moving some markets here this morning. We've got our market mantras that are very clear that we've been tracking over the course of 2023. There are mantras and cliches like don't fight the Fed, buy the rumor, sell the news, and sell in May, go away. Some of these phrases held up this year, but does that mean that they'll work in 2024? So let's break them down and grade these adages, starting with don't fight the Fed. That market mantra was pretty solid all year long. We gave it an A. Fight the Fed at your own risk. Uh, well, I mean, Yeah, at your own risk, yes. It, the, the, once the Fed signaled that it was going to pivot on rates, it was off to the races for markets. And yeah. if you're a short seller or someone who bets against the markets, uh, betting against Jerome Powell really proved to be a really absolute failure of a trade this year, Brad. And historically, I think that has proven the case as well. Well, there was much of a, a see what you want type of mentality, especially when it came to some of the economic data. And I, I think we saw this, especially within, I believe it was the November, November jobs report where the report I mean, we've gotten some reports that haven't been blowout reports have not met expectations and, and some of them kind of coming in weaker than expectations but still there was I think on that day a consumer sentiment or consumer confidence number that came out and the markets gave so much more credence to that and said oh no we're back baby and ultimately I think it's really just this juggling of which data tells us the story that we actually want to to lean further into and placing trades around that all right next uh, market mantra I, well, I will add this too real quick. Um, you know, fighting the Fed is just it has proven to be wrong because investors have been trained that every time the Fed suggests a land of lower interest rates, uh, that is not you know that is a good thing for markets. It expands price to earnings multiples and does what it uh, does what it needs to do. Yeah, another market mantra: Santa Claus rally. Santa Claus rally. What was it? Uh, uh, the Santa Claus rally. So, what cliches should we need to hear in the new year? We have Cole Smead, Smead Capital Management CEO, and Matt Maley, Miller Tayback. Managing Director and Equity Strategist. Cole, let me get over to you. Which uh, market mantra do you think may work pretty well next year? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I think the idea of don't fight the Fed, um, what really markets have been swinging around on is the futures markets, right? What the futures uh, are expecting has been really what's you know moved markets around. So the future uses this year, the futures are betting that, that we're going to wake up on lower rates you know, on the short end of the curve and thus, you know, ultimately on the long end of the curve. And um, my only problem with that or our only problem with that whole mantra is that it's been a terrible place to bet with for two years. They've been wrong for two years. So we find it interesting that people have, in effect, fought the Fed. The Fed stayed fairly tight um, relative to history and in a very aggressive way. And stock investors think that will not affect how people look at things. And so we just think that's kind of fantasy land. We think that mantra is going to hold true. And anything short of the Fed waking up, you know, uh, over 400 basis points on short end of the curve, we think equity markets are re really going to be hamstrung by that. Matt, I want to bring you into this as well. The, the mantra that kind of stands out to you the most over the course of this year, and, wh and what's the holds true going into 24? Well, this, this whole thing that, that Paul was just talking about is, is something I, I totally agree with, is that, you know, we don't want to fight the Fed, uh, but number one, uh, the Fed has only stopped uh, uh, raising rates. They haven't actually started uh, cutting yet. But more importantly, I think what the markets are doing right now and the futures markets uh, that they're following is uh, is pricing in a return to the uh, uh, to the free money era. And uh, I just don't see that happening. I mean, interest rates have come down quite a bit, obviously, uh, in the last two months, uh, but they're still much, much higher than they were in 2021 and, and way higher than 2020. Uh, and, and so th this thought that uh, we can go back to those, you know, kind of crazy valuations of, of 20 times earnings. And, uh, and, and my thing is I look at, at, at price to sales even more because you can fudge earnings a, a, a lot. You can't fudge sales. And we're 2.6 times sales now in the S&P 500. And except for 2021 and the very beginning of 2022 when it started falling, it's never been this overvalued. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're going to have to see a big improvement in the economy next year, a big improvement in earnings, uh, a lot more than the, than the consensus is looking for right now for the market to do a lot better. So, uh, you know, not fighting the Fed is, is a good idea, but, you know, until they really start 
cutting rates, and, and unless they cut them dramatically, which I don't see them doing, uh, uh, unless there's a crisis, which will cause other problems, uh, I, I think that uh, I agree with Paul with what he's saying. Cole, if, uh, if one is inclined to, to not fight the Fed again next year, what trades work best, do you think? Well, just to give you an analogous period, we, this looks a lot like um, 1972. Just to take everybody back, there was a bear market uh, coming off the late 1960s. It wiped out the average equity investor. Let's just call that 2022. Um, and then you had a pickup in the nifty 50 to the peak in December of 1972. That's what we're having. That is the Santa Claus rally that happened you know, late in that year uh, for the nifty 50. The problem is it was only 50 stocks from the likes of you know, uh, Morgan Guarantee. And that's what we're seeing now. It's the Magnificent Seven or the Nifty Seven, if you want to call it that. So the problem with that is that's carried the equity indexes higher. And the danger is, um, you know, if you're the Fed, you're looking at two. I, I think there's primary two things they're having trouble with. One, government largesse. Government spending is not backing off. It will not back off. It's politically popular. That's a big problem for the Fed. The second part is the weakest part of the economy historically would be low end wages dropping off and getting hurt. That is not happening. Wages continue to outpunch inflation in general right now. Um, and then if you look at the lowest wages, they're doing, they've done the best for two years. That keeps the Fed stuck. I think those two things coalescing together is a bad cocktail. It will not cause a fun 2024 hangover. Matt, do you believe that there's going to be some type of massive rotation that we see out of the Magnificent Seven? I mean, we've witnessed the climb over the course of this year. Seven stocks, essentially, in the S&P 500 that have garnered this much attention. Uh, and to Cole's point, you know, if we are that much overweighted in those seven stocks at this point, does it, does it seem like there's some type of rug pull? Uh, or if generative AI doesn't pan out the way that many had, in, had invested in the thesis that it was just going to be passed through as another type of services margin uh, part of the business, how, how does that impact these brands? Well, I mean, the, the, one of the things that we have to be concerned about with this whole rotation idea, and it sounds good because when we do get a narrow market, uh, you know, a, a, a rather narrow market for a period of time, and it starts to broaden out, that's 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 very very uh, bullish. However, when you get an incredibly narrow market like we've had recently, and we had back in the early 1970s, we've had other times. Whenever that takes place. Uh, at least over the last 40 years, the market never expands enough. I mean, you always see the, uh, the those you know, the ones that have really led the market higher, the small number of names come back down. We never see the narrow market, the the, uh, the rest of the market play catch up. Uh, it's just the, the way it happens. The same thing is true when you get the market as expensive as it is now. Well, we all like to think that it can that the economy can play catch up, but usually what happens is that the best you can hope for is meeting somewhere in the middle, and more likely that uh, the stock prices have to come back down. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, we are starting. You know, the thing is, every single time we have this situation, it looks like the market can play catch up, and that's what we're seeing right now. But eventually, uh, we get to the situation where it just we just can't get that kind of uh, a catch up in the in, in the economy. And the one thing I really want to talk about is the, this whole thing with earnings. It's great to talk about. Hey, er, you know, earnings were flat this year. We had all we had was multiple expansion. Okay. Uh, well, earnings are uh, expected to be up 12 percent next year. That's great, but that still leaves us on a very expensive side of the market. I mean, we're going to be still be looking at, uh, you know, 20 uh, times earnings or higher. We're going to need a lot more than tw uh, 12 times. Uh, sorry, a 12 percent increase in S and P earnings if this market's going to rally a lot more. And and to be honest with you, I just don't see that right now. I don't want to be overly bearish here, but at the same time, we have to look at history, and it tells us a lot of things are happening right now, which which are signals of tops. But because the market is rallying in a par parabolic way, a lot of investors are ignoring that right now. And I think that, that, that that's something they shouldn't really be doing. Claw, another mantra we're focused on here uh, at Yahoo Finance uh, today, uh, that is, is buy the rumor, sell the news. And that certainly uh, seemed to do NVIDIA quite well uh, this year. What happens to AI plays like NVIDIA next year? We get results that maybe aren't as robust as they were this year. Do you think we see sell-offs? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the good thing for the stocks that have played that up is it's, it's greatly grown their multiples. Um, that's what they've done successfully. And as I think you watch executives sell their stock in the open market, I mean, that's played right into their hands. Um, the flip side is you actually have to go out and do those things. And as we've learned in prior episodes of Euphoria like this on subjects in the past, is that that can take a long time. I mean, 
just just go back and look at what happened in the late 90s. I mean, you could pull up the Cisco's, the Oracle's, very few of them ended up ever going to new high prices after that. Um, you know, Microsoft obviously successfully did, but they had to go through a decade of hell to get there. Um, what I, I think the real danger in buy the rumor, sell the news is it is highly likely that while we have retirees as excited about owning stocks as they've really ever been as a, as a, as a group of investors in, in, in stocks, um, we, it is likely the S&P might not make money over the next decade, including dividends. And um, when I say likely, that's our bet. And the other thing that I would throw out is in real terms, that's a nightmare for those retirees. That is the kind of world that people are not preparing for on this hype and excitement. And the question is, is stock market failure going to cause everyone to lose enthusiasm for stocks? And that is the real danger. I mean, if you're in the wealth management business, if you're in the stock picking business, if you're in the indexing business, that sucks. The question is, what are you doing differently? And I, I think the, the one thing you know is you can't play into that hype. That's the real danger. And then just lastly, while we got you guys here with us, Matt, sell in May, go away. Of course, a very popular adage year in, year out. How effective was that this year? I mean, you could see we gave it an F. But it also depends upon what time you came back in the market, perhaps. I want to get your perspective on this. Well, yes, yeah, so sell in May and go away uh, obviously worked uh, very poorly. It, it, it actually does work. Usually, uh, uh, and history shows that, but obviously it was a complete disaster this year. Part of that had to do with the influx of liquidity that the Fed pushed into the into the system during because of the uh, the regional banking crisis, and and uh, the thing all uh, exacerbated itself because we had the budget issues uh, in in June, and that uh, made the supply demand of Treasuries much different. And again, that left a lot of liquidity in the marketplace uh, that is still kind of uh, sitting out there, and as, as that becomes less plentiful. Uh, it's going to be much uh, much tougher for for the, the uh, for the market to rally further. I mean, I think Cole is, is so right in, in so many different areas. I mean, and that's why I think that some of these calls recently we've heard in, in, around Wall Street that to go, go all in with stocks. I mean, what what if we're wrong? Maybe the market does go up another twenty five percent, but having some cash, so people say, oh, he missed so and so missed the market. Well, if you only have five percent cash or ten percent cash or fifteen percent cash, you don't miss the entire move. Uh, and besides, you are getting paid for some. Of that cash, and if we do see a deep correction or even just a mild correction, you'll have some money on the sidelines to put put to use. So, uh, I, I just you know, people need to be very very careful about this this parabolic rally we've seen in the last couple of months, and assume that's going to go uh, continue throughout 2024. All right, let's leave it there. Uh, Cole Smead and Matt Maley, uh, good to see you both. Thanks for coming on throughout the year with uh, really some great analysis. Really, uh, really appreciate it. All right, much more markets analysis straight ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
As 2023 comes to a close, we know the narrative on AI, the MAG7, and the world's weirdest equity reality. But what about those stocks that we used to love that are facing some tricky times? What's going to happen to the 2023 laggards that were once pandemic darlings? Who better to tell us than Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery? Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad, thank you for that. And let's think about those pandemic darlings, Peloton, Zoom, Moderna, practically the poster child for the pandemic. I mean, they had the first vaccine. This is what we're looking at for some of those stocks this year. And we can see some outperformance by Coinbase up 404%, Moderna down 44%. So it's a game of have and have nots. But over the last two years, it's just a game of have nots for the most part, rocket up about 5%. But uh, a lot of these stocks really just a shadow of what they once were. You take a look at Carvana, that's up a thousand percent this year. Uh, and this is year to date, pretty impressive. But when you take a look over the last two years, it is a different story. It is still locked into the bottom end of its trading range over this period of time. And when you take a look at the five year, a lot of these charts simply look like the same. Before the pandemic, you have some activity down here. Then we got this giant mountain and a steep fall off and just trying to find their footing somewhere in the lower end of their range. But they're not all like that. And in fact, over the last two months, some of these stocks have come back pretty strong. Uh, take a look at Coinbase, which is up 151% over the last two months. I'll show you the year to date so you can uh, get a different context here. This is absolutely incredible, but very much tied to Bitcoin. And since this stock is tied to different fundamentals than a lot of others, um, I think it has a decent chance of fully coming back. Here's a look at the five year. Uh, you can see it is in a much higher range than uh, Carvana, for instance, that we were just looking at. Uh, but I don't feel that way about all of these stocks. And uh, in fact, let me just show you, some of these are pretty close to their 52 week highs here, and some are not. And for that, I would say, if you're a stock and you haven't been able to rally in the last two weeks, uh, that's a problem for the market. Here's BuzzFeed. That's down 94% from its record from its 52 week high, not its record high. Here's AMC. Uh, that's down 95% over the last five years. Here's uh, over the last two years. You can see 97.8%. That's basically zero for some zero for somebody who bought at the top, except you're still in the game. So what are you going to do if you're holding on to some of these stocks and it's not looking promising for the new year? This is the last day of tax loss harvesting. You can still get a tax advantage on some of these stocks. And let me just show you um, some historical examples of why you might want to ditch some of these longer term losers. Uh, here is Intel. I'm going to show you a max chart. This is a turnaround story, and I happen to like the fundamentals right now. But you take a look at what happened during the dot com boom and bust. This stock was dead, year, was dead money for decades here, and it's only recently come back. Um, if you were holding that, you were, simply spend, you were simply sitting on money that was not being productively used. Here's Cisco, very similar story. Dot-com boom, dot-com bust. It's still in the middle of its trading range right there after 20 20 years. Micron, very similar story. This is another chip stock. It has come back really nicely. Let's take a look at the five year. This is a stock you might have wanted to bought five years ago or a few years ago, uh, but holding for 20 years was clearly a bad idea. Now, here's one of my favorite charts. Here's Citigroup, a max chart. Look at this. Global financial crisis hit, and in fact, this was a this was a decade-long high that it was maintaining. It is still down 90% from those levels. That's two decades later. 90% has not come back. You want to take a look at another stock, Deutsche Bank, another financial stock, got decimated during the financial crisis, down 82%, but down more than 90% from these highs. So uh, take a look at your stock here. If it's looking like one of these that I was just showing you, like Citigroup, uh, probably going to take a while for it to come back, especially in this environment. But if you're taking a look at Carvana, or excuse me, Coinbase here, maybe even Carvana, um, the fact that it's been able to reclaim some of this lost territory puts it in better footing for the new year, guys. Brutal chart on Citigroup, Jared. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. <clears throat> All right, travel boom this year. Passenger travel volume surpassed pre-pandemic levels as well. And a big winner in the travel industry was Cruise Lines. We spoke to Royal Caribbean CEO Jason Liberty earlier this year on the company's 2024 outlook. What about 2024 and beyond? Is it still smooth sailing? Yeah, well, really, uh, over the past couple months and certainly right now, most of the bookings we're taking on is for 2024. So the demand trends that we've seen earlier in the year is very much flowing into 2024 and even into 2025. 
And what are your ex expectations for EBITDA through 2025? We know you have the trifecta program where you're trying to hit three benchmarks. Where do you stand with that? Yeah, so we're very much on track for our trifecta goals. You know, one is to uh, to to get to triple digit EBITDA per APCD. Second one is to, is to be well into uh, the, the teens on an ROIC basis, um, and then getting our earnings up, 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 up into the double digit zone, um, again, as we burn off a lot of this negative carry uh, that we had to take in during the pandemic. So we feel really good about the cash flow generation of the business, um, and we feel we're very in line uh, with our trifecta goals. And let's talk about the customer, the type of customer you have now. There were people during the pandemic who said they would never return to cruise. Are you seeing a return of loyalists, previous customers, or are your customers now new to cruise? Yeah. So historically, you know, pre-pandemic, about a third of our guests were new to cruise, a third of our guests were loyalists, and a third of our guests were first to brand. Um, what we see now is one propensity to cruise has completely returned back to where it was in, in 2019. But we're seeing more new to cruise than we had seen in 2019. We're seeing more first to brand, which is very much in line with our growth expectations for our capacity growth as our new ships come on. And what about the demographics? Cruise tend to attract uh, more of middle-aged customers. And of course, you have families. What are the demographics like now? And what are you doing to attract younger customers? Yeah. So, so you know, we have really three core brands that are really in their different segments. And so they all address different um, age and demographic categories. Like our royal brand is very focused um, on, on multi-generational family. Our, our celebrity brand, people that are in their early 50s, um, more Gen X. Um, in nature, and then our Silver Sea brand, which is ultra luxury and expedition, um, tend to attract a little a bit of the baby boomer um, side of things. What we are seeing is the guest is actually a little bit younger um, on average than what we saw pre-pandemic, and a lot of that is because there's more millennials that are now into the, the system as they got married and started to have kids and, and, and are looking to experience incredible uh, travel experiences. Like, That's awesome. Like All right, and talk to me about pricing. How is that holding up uh, in the face of consumers starting to make cutbacks in different areas of their life? We're hearing that from different uh, industries, different companies. Uh, what are you seeing and how are you dealing with that from a pricing basis? Yeah, so we've actually seen and we continue to see the ability to raise price in the current market. It, which is somewhat counterintuitive to you know, the point you just made and also counterintuitive to some of the information out that's, that's out there. The main driver of that, um, one, I think, is you know, having best brands, best ships win. Um, and our guests you know, get this incredible experience on our ships, and that gets uh, broadcasted through advocacy of our, of our guests who are, who are experiencing that. But there's also a pretty significant value gap to land-based vacation. Um, and so as, as RevPAR and other things went up on the hotels and land-based vacations, you know, we have that opportunity now to begin to close that gap. And that gap was about 15, 20% pre-pandemic. Today it's about 35 to 45%. And we're going to make a you know a, a, a pretty good dent in it here in uh, in 2023. Is revenge travel still a thing? I think it's less about revenge travel. We don't really see in our surveying of our guests. It's more that the guest has shifted back to this trajectory of experiences outpacing buying stuff, and that's what we're seeing from our guests and what we and, and what we collect in our survey data is they bought enough stuff. What they want to do is collect experiences, create stories with their friends and family and loved ones. Um, and fortunately, that that's a that's, that's what we do for a living. Okay, and I got to ask you about tipping. Tipping is a big part of cruise life. Mm -hmm. Your waiter, your steward, your purser. Uh, but there's been kind of this backlash about tipflation. How do you keep customers and staff happy given that kind of climate? Yeah, so you know, so we're in, we're not in a place where we're you know we're charging for um, you know a, a kitchen fee or those type of things. You know, we we have a gratuity. Um, it, it raises typically just based off of how inflation is changing, um, and that's that's more what it is. It's pretty much a standard fee. Of course, our guests can can provide more. The guests can also choose not to you know not to tip if they don't you know choose to. But but a gratuity based system, a service based system, we think is really important. But we're not you know chopping at every corner here on on tipping. Uh, you know, we have a you know, pretty much a standard uh, fee for it. And our thanks to Diane King Hall for that interview. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
2023 was the year of change, with companies touting plans to evolve their business for the future. Starbucks announced its triple shot reinvention back in November as it strives for long term growth. I guess that's a well named uh, hat tip to the Starbucks marketing department for cooking that one up. But if you go back to this release on what this reinvention plan is, two things stick out to me or really stand out to me that Starbucks has to start delivering on next year if this stock is going to come off the lows. Really a dreadful year for Starbucks uh, investors. One, a lot unlock efficiency. As part of this plan, Starbucks trying to generate $3 billion in savings over three years. Two billion of that outside the store, so things it's doing outside of its own stores that are probably wasteful, make no sense, and should be cut. Uh, and then number two, reinvigorate, Brad, the partner culture. And this is really speaking to, I think, the ongoing union issues that uh, continue to plague Starbucks. Uh, I think from, some folks could easily make the argument they continue to get worse. Bottom line for me is that they are not going anywhere. And like we said yesterday and, er and even earlier in the week, Starbucks has to address this, get it done and dusted once and for all, whatever that might mean. But I probably come at the expense of the company's bottom line. So here's some of the benchmarks that you can grade Starbucks up against, especially for this reinvention plan, the triple shot reinvention plan, as you <laughs> mentioned a moment ago, as the company has set out some of these goals. Growing comps by 5 to 7 percent with revenue growth to at the low end of the 10 to 12 percent range, earnings growth of 15 to 20 percent. You can grade them on that based on some of the prevailing trends that they set guidance for for fiscal 2024. Bottom line here, though, you got to think about the international relevance of this brand as well. They're talking within this plan about what the growth needs to look like both here domestically but as well as internationally and in the core market of China. And so one of the huge things that is important to remember is especially across some of the plays that can be looked at like a Starbucks where you still need to have a strong corporate and also relationship with the franchisees, the partners as they call them, where those partners might be tough to find, especially in a tough purchasing or tough financing environment like we're in right now. And perhaps that is only going to get more difficult for the company going into next year. Just give me a cheaper iced coffee, Starbucks. I just want the unicorn frap to come back. <laughs> also, let's talk about a magical place, Disney. It's less magical this year. They launched a reinvention plan of its own with Bob Iger back at the helm, starting with job cuts. Those job cuts coming early in the year. This was a way that Bob Iger was trying to signal to the activist campaigns that were coming out of nowhere, like the Kemi Mutombo blocking a shot, that was unexpected for any basketball players out there. You know the reference. The finger wagging, the, the activist campaigns were essentially throwing at Disney as, as well as the tisk tisk. At the end of the day, that was his own type of efforts to try and say, hey, I've got a handle on costs. I have a handle on getting back to profit. And oh, yeah, by the way, we might be thinking about a business or a life without ESPN here at Disney. That's still some of the larger questions that lingered. And even after that, later on in the year, you saw this company hit, what, eight year lows. So a lot of these questions still linger, as well as just a, I think, longer leadership question at the company of, Who's after Iger at the end of the day? Because that's still unclear at this point. And what do you do with these legacy assets? Now, we're still watching Paramount reportedly shopping itself, uh, whether they go to Warner Brothers, Discovery, that is to be determined. But it's one thing uh, for investors to speculate um, and analysts to speculate, uh, sure, sell off your legacy TV assets like ABC, Disney, but who is buying it? You have to have a willing buyer and it has to come at a good price. You just don't say, hey, we're going to just unload these assets and they're just going to float out there in the ethosphere. And I just think, Brad, it's going to be hard for Iger to do this because it would be him acknowledging that he didn't see this coming 10 years ago. And, and he would really, I think, hurt his legacy if he were to spin off these assets. And at the end of the day, too, you've got to think about what they're going to do to continue to invest in some of the businesses that they've signaled that they're going to develop even more on top of. I think most notably at the parks and resorts business. Mm -hmm. More expansion internationally, more development upon the thousands of acres of land that they've got in Florida that are undeveloped at this point, too. So that's more money that's potentially going out the door, but to buy into or to spend into an experience where they're already going to be charging the customer more. And that's another element where the customer is going to have to grapple with how much are we comfortable to pay for those magical passes that allow us to skip the line when we go to Disney World. So true. All right. And lastly, and Gap. The company has struggled to connect with consumers, but its new CEO is looking to change that. Uh, and Brad, look, I, I've been very critical of Gap for going on over 10 years. Sales have just been dreadful. Margins dreadful. They've closed hundreds of stores. And it's not just the Gap division. It's been the Old Navy division. The Banana Republic division sometimes call, falls into favor with investors. But now the new CEO, Richard Dixon, uh, really the guy who saved uh, Mattel now at the helm uh, uh, over at Gap. And I've had the time, I've had a moment to just connect with Richard on, just to get a sense of what he might be focusing on for 2024. I do think you will see 
an investor day from Gap, uh, some point middle of next year, where they try to reset the, the investor narrative for the company. But as I've learned, covering CEOs for a long time, any new CEO is likely within their first six to 12 months come out with some form of restructuring plan. I think that is going to be uh, a key initial playbook by Richard, whether it, it is closing more stores, uh, fine tuning its manufacturing capacity, I do think that plan will hit uh, in the first half of next year. And then secondarily, what Richard does very well is marketing. He is a marketing whiz, but he also, uh, I think he understands the apparel industry. Having spent a long time over at Jones Apparel Group, I think he will bring more stylish things that human beings want to actually buy from a Gap and Republic uh, inside of their stores next year. But again, a big turnaround and a tall ask uh, to drive that turnaround over at Gap. Does it mean, from your perspective, because you've, come to, you've covered this company for a long time, does it mean that they need to grow up another in-house brand? And I think about what they're doing that started off as, as a relevance and, and kind of collaboration partnership with Dapper Dan and starting Dap underneath of Gap and having a few hoodies there. Um, but now they're expanding that into a kid's clothing line. Does it need another kind of reinvigoration of the brand with another subsidy within there? I'll throw you a curveball. I think Gap and, and Richard, they have to go back and consider splitting the company back up. Now, this was on the mm -hmm. table a couple of years ago. Prior management ultimately decided not to do it. I just, I just think it would be more value creating for these brands to trade on their own merit and, and ultimately that would drive more focus with, uh, with each, each brand. Gap is focused on Gap, Banana is focused on, on Banana, and then Old Navy of course focused on uh, Old Navy. Uh, we also want to talk about one more stock that's striving for its own reinvention plan that's beyond meat. My team letting me mention this yet again. Stock really shot up over 8% uh, about a I don't know, about a half an hour ago on our analysis, of course, we had a really exclusive interview with uh, Beyond Me founder and CEO Ethan Brown. Stock pulling back a little bit, but nonetheless, I think Ethan is trying to figure out what gets more people back into uh, the plant-based meat category, and it's something that Peter McGinnis, his counterpart, the CEO of Impossible Foods, is trying to do as well. You got to just ask yourself, has it bottomed out? I mean, this is a company in Beyond Meat that it was really a gauge for another company in Impossible Foods, which at the time was a unicorn. I don't know what their valuation is at this point. It's kind of fallen into obscurity at, at this juncture, but for Beyond Meat, still the closest thing that anybody in the market has to look at as an alternative meat play that is out there and has its own operations now and that is trying to get more partnerships both on the wholesale partnership side going into more of the retail footprints and then on the restaurant side trying to drum up even more demand for, uh, you know, beyond, what, a beyond bacon, egg, and cheese in the morning or beyond sausage, egg, and cheese? I don't even know if they do bacon yet, but at the end of the day, it's going to require them to get into more meats. Yeah. More meats. <laughs> More meats. It's going to come. More meats for you. All right. It's been a roller coaster ride for the retail sector in 2023. Higher inflation rocked wallets as companies adjusted through price increases, but the consumer remained largely resilient. Back in October, we spoke with Levi CFO Harmeet Singh on the state of the consumer, which he called a tale of two worlds. It's a tale of two worlds. You have the um, you know the uh, low income to moderate in income consumer under pressure they have to take decisions uh, you know and they being a lot more discretionary you know our view is um, when they shop you know they want to shop with brands they can trust they want to shop with brands that are offering relevant products and uh, and so we bring that and brands that give good price value equation what we have done in in quarter 3 and it started being implemented by our uh, customers in the US. We took you know, six of our 120 uh, fits and we did reduce the prices to make, it, to make our uh, products um, uh, and our price value equation a lot more attractive. Uh, and then with innovation and the pipeline of newer products, I think that brings a lot more relevance. And so you know, we're offering uh, you know, to the consumer really what he or she wants and that I think for brands like us that continue to grow market share, I, you know, will board well for the longer term. The retail sector struggled heading into the holiday season with warning signs flashing on difficult times ahead. Target chairman and CEO Brian Cornell was one of the several leaders in the space to give a cautious outlook, warning of a slowdown in consumer spending as people grapple with higher prices and, of course, returning student loans during the usually busy time of year. In November, we spoke with Walmart CFO John David Rainey about how his company was handling high inflation and nervous shoppers. When we talk about relief on the consumer, I think the first thing that we need to talk about 
is inflation. We've seen high inflation for two years now. When we look at the month of October, broadly across the categories of our business, inflation is about 2%, so much better than what it was. And you actually have to look at that by category to really understand what's happening. So food and consumables tend to be in that 2 to 4% range. General merchandise is actually, we've seen a pretty sharp drop off just in the last couple of weeks, where that is deflating year over year. So prices are less than where they were a year ago, and actually getting pretty close to where they were two years ago. And so what the impact that that's had on the consumer is they've had less money, their wallets have been stretched more thinly because of higher prices. And so they've focused on those things that they need versus the things that they want. And so as that pertains to the period of time that we're going into right now, the holiday shopping period, they're, they're waiting for these holiday specials, for these big events to buy those bigger ticket items, those TVs, those homes and elect, the home and electronic type categories that uh, we're seeing stronger spending in. But I think everything else said, like, we want to see lower prices. That's good for our customers. We want to be able to pass that along to them. And I think the consumer needs some relief right now. Despite some difficult times for the sector, one bright spot was Abercrombie and Fitch. The retailer raised its full year guidance and touted an encouraging start to its holiday shopping season on the back of its third quarter earnings report in November. We spoke to the CEO of Abercrombie and Fitch, Fran Horowitz, on why her company is seeing so much success. The consumer has an opportunity, you know, the consumer has a choice on where to shop and they are choosing us because the product, the voice, the experience is what they're looking for. And that's a result of staying close to the customer and really understanding what, what they want. Really importantly though, Brian, this lesson that we learned from COVID about keeping our inventories lean is really, really paying off. Our inventories are clean. They are a result of testing and learning and the supply chain being back on target and being able to be fluid is really a big win for us. We built a muscle into our sourcing and our, um, and our, into our logistics team that's really driving, helping us drive the business. Pre-COVID, I think the retailers chased every last sale, and there was a lot of sales that were just not profitable and you didn't want to have them. And today, it's much more important to stay lean and make sure you have the right assortment in your, in, in, in your inventory. When we decided many, many years ago, as you were on that journey with me, that we could decide whether we were going to have one, way back, right, was it one brand or two? And we realized that we could make Hollister the iconic global teen brand and age Abercrombie up into this young millennial brand where there was a big white space in the market. So the teams are focused on the 25 plus, maybe 25 to 30 for merchandising, marketing, et cetera. But those that are shopping with us go way beyond that. And they're very excited about the fact that we have diversity in, in sizing and in, in fabrications and categories. And that's what they're responding to. And that's your retail wrap up. We've got much more of your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway CEO, is one of the most successful investors in history. The Oracle of Omaha is set to enter the new year with more than 40 holdings in Berkshire's portfolio. And all of those holdings we saw Buffett liking Occidental Petroleum, Apple, and Chinese electronic maker BYD this year. We'll see if he likes those stocks again in 2024. There's a range of companies that you can throw into the Warren Buffett favor bucket, if you will, that have seen some type of attention thrust their direction as a result of Berkshire Hathaway initiating a position at this point, Occidental is one of those positions that they have to report um, within their own filings as well because of the fact that they own so much of the company, uh, but still one of the top holdings, Apple, that's going to continue to catch attention as well. Hey, you know what? I, maybe this isn't a surprise, but what Buffett doesn't really own is that true AI play. Now, none of these AI plays are classic Buffett. A lot of them are trading uh, priced earnings multiples well above the S&P 500. They're trading well above their book value per share. So it doesn't, these are not classic investments, but uh, Brad, Buffett has mentioned in the past that he has misnames like Amazon that have right. driven the, the tech movement. So do we see Warren Buffett trying to play a little catch up uh, in 2024 by getting involved with some of these AI plays. Does he go out there and buy some Salesforce? Does he make a, a, a play for NVIDIA on a pullback? I, I think that is going to be an interesting story to follow because I don't see Apple, at least right now, being a major AI player. Now they're supposed to launch uh, some, some uh, reality headset goggles, but to me, that is not the pure AI play. Yeah, it's just a matter of what AI actually looks like in critical mass in people's fingertips and you know at the top of their mind every day doing are leveraging AI to the same extent that they even Google things at this point. I mean, you can argue that Buffett rotated out of his, really one of his first AI plays, that's HP. He mm. purchased HP, but he's been uh, unloading his stake in that company. Now, HP next year should be a main player in getting these AI PCs to market. A lot of folks on the street really banking on a major reset or refresh cycle in the PC market uh, driven by the likes of HP. Yeah, well, maybe Microsoft will catch a bid from Buffett. Yeah, maybe, indeed. <laughs> All right, now, uh, we have uh, uh, the biggest lessons we learned in 2023 coming up next. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning, Wall Street. Straight from Yahoo Finance's front page to your mobile phones and to your streaming apps. Watch our new flagship show, The Morning Brief. Your first stop as we guide you through the day's market action. We give you insights into the latest market moving news. Real time analysis of today's top stories and actionable information about your investments. We bring you the opening bell on Wall Street. And don't miss our strategy sessions with Wall Street's top analysts. It's the Morning Brief. It's the Morning Brief. The Morning Brief. Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief, empowering you to make smart investing decisions. Tune in daily at 9 a.m. Eastern. Reflecting on three areas that hopium sprung eternal this year, hope for a Fed pivot, hope for shelter cost slippage, and hopes that have been built on the there's a generative AI for that awakening. Fourth quarter 2022 was the first time I'd ever heard the term hopium pipe during a jobs day conversation with RSM's Joe Brasuelas at the time, remarking on investors jonesing for a pause, a pivot, or just an idea of a break and hitting the hopium pipe. Now, seeing the data that best supported bullish animal spirits, which was the case for the beginning of this year, 2023, into late July, certainly came to fruition. So as we ultimately think about what is set to come here, hopium for a Fed rate cut, hopium for 2024 rate cuts and these the crystal ball expectations vary. But what is starting to becoming a reality is a pivot. Fast forward, speaking with Yahoo Finance in December, Nick Timoreos makes it clear that any rate cuts would be dependent on inflation continuing to decline. He says it does seem like the FOMC could be moving ahead of the discussions around when to cut rates after January if inflation's continuing to come down. So what's the next thing? Hopium that shelter costs will improve. Still, pesky as part of inflation. U.S. housing market plagued by mortgage rates, high mortgage rates, low inventory in 2023. Pal, in the meeting at December, after picking up somewhat over the summer, activity in the housing sector has flattened, remains well below the levels of a year ago. Reflecting higher mortgage rates, Meredith Whitney says two things. Job-based population migration, as well as the silver tsunami, are 
the trends that are expected to start in the latter part of 2024 and continue into the next several years. And then hopefully bringing more people back into the home buying market. And then finally here, let's just jump to the hopium that generative AI is a silver bullet. Seven stocks driving the material gains of the S&P 500 as benefits from generative AI that have been touted by technology executives are hypercharged productivity, accelerated intelligence, and fattened margins all continue to be thrown out there. So these are the areas that the hopium faces a reality check in 2024. But to wrap up this year on a positive note, we can all continue to hope for innovative, life-improving business models, balanced leadership, and investors driving markets here uh, to hope for healthy gains, election civility, and growing your wealth in 2024 as well. No chance in hell I am topping uh, Hopium Pie. Nonetheless, the biggest investing lesson I was reminded of this year, and one that should apply to your entire investing career, is that it's all about the people. People are the ones that are designing those super powerful NVIDIA AI chips that have sent NVIDIA stock up more than 240% this year. People are the ones that have helped put in motion or turnaround stories such as the one over at chip giant Intel. And people are the ones that have gotten Disney into its current mess of a bloated cost structure and an activist investor attack by Tron's Nelson Peltz. As an investor, a big part of your job is to understand the people on the playing field for they are the ones driving the financial statements and stock price. To that end, a heartfelt thank you to our many teams at Yahoo Finance who are up around the clock putting on live shows, fine-tuning our enormous website, and reporting on the people that make global business tick. We truly have an amazing group here, and we can't wait to show you what we have on tap at Yahoo Finance in 2024. Happy New Year to you all. We are here because of the Yahoo Finance community. And to that end, Brad, we have to do our traditional champagne toast. Are you opening this? We have all this new studio equipment. I'm afraid to you got I don't this. get this stuff, stuff all over the place. And I did that without popping on my eye. Brad, it's a pleasure to uh, have filled in this seat uh, with you this week and talk some stocks. Here you go. It's great to close out the and, year strong. Uh, our very, I should say, Shauna Smith uh, off this week, really holding it down on the morning show, Shauna. doing a tremendous, tremendous job, as is uh, our afternoon team of Julie Hyman uh, and uh, Josh Lipton, of course, Rochelle Kufo and Akiko Fujita in the, uh, in the 11 to 12 hours. Brad, cheers to you. Cheers Happy to New you. Year, my friend. Really Absolutely. good to see you. And thank you all for the support uh, from the Yahoo Finance team. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll be right back uh, for you in 2024. But lots more market analysis and probably more talk of NVIDIA. Diane King, Hall, Diane King Hall will have you next in the next hour. We'll see you soon.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Diane King Hall. Here's a look at what we're watching. It's the final countdown. We've reached the last trading day of 2023, and we're going to take a look back at what Wall Street's gotten wrong this year and what this signals for the year to come. Included in the final countdown, oil is heading for its largest annual drop since 2020. What this means for the energy market come 2024. Plus, the battle of the AI bots. Baidu is taking on OpenAI, announcing its Ernie bot has amassed over 100 million users. How will this AI craze unfold? We'll discuss coming up this hour. But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at some relatively low volume here, relatively flat as well, but red across the board, the Dow currently off about 32 points. The S&P 500 also down about nine points, about 0.2%. Tech heavy Nasdaq seeing the biggest decline so far this morning, down about half a percent, seeing some pressure on Microsoft this morning, down about 69 points so far for the Nasdaq. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as well. We're seeing bond yields up today, down for the week at a mixed picture year today, really reflecting the roller coaster that bonds have been on this year. But as we close out, we see the five year up about a third of a percent, the 10 year also seeing gains of about half a percent, and the longest term 30 year yield up 0.65%. Well, Pobody's nerfix. No, I haven't hit that New Year's champagne too early. That's what strategists and economists learned this year. Here are the top three things that Wall Street got wrong in 2023 is our very own Madison I Mills. I was like, hey, what is in the prompter what? for exactly. Rochelle? I was worried about you and you crushed it. And so did our team who wrote that in the prompter for you, Rochelle. But uh, Wall Street did not necessarily crush it in 2023. I want to run through three different things uh, that we really saw go wrong in terms of the calls this year. Recession, bearishness, and China. So starting with the recession calls, GDP stayed strong over the past year. We saw inflation cooling and the consumer continuing to spend. The bet from a lot of strategists was that the consumer was going to start to finally buckle under the uh, rapid ten tension and continuation of inflation. And we did not see that this year. In fact, the consumer continued to spend, spend, and spend. Uh, it's just another reminder, never bet against the consumer, which makes up two thirds of our GDP. Uh, that spending starting to lean into credit card delinquencies in the recent data. So that's going to be something to watch heading into the new year. Uh, but it looks like that recession call is starting to be on the back burner, particularly when you look at the market action, which brings me to my next bad call. There's a reason why a lot of the bears are in hibernation mode when we've gotten these calls for 2024. That's because their calls for this past year were uh, not correct, to put it lightly. The S&P 500 climbing more than 20 percent, the Nasdaq over 50 percent. That was the biggest annual gain for both indices since the dot-com boom. Uh, we saw earnings growth, growth across the board as well. Mike Wilson uh, was saying that we were not going to see earnings growth because, again, the consumer was going to buckle under inflation and that companies were not going to have the pricing power that they did previously. Neither of those ended up being true. We we saw a lot of earnings growth over the past year, and uh, the S&P was inching toward highs today, record-breaking highs. I'm not so sure we're going to be able to break that news today, uh, but still a banner year, of course, for the S&P, given that consumer growth and the AI boom. And lastly, we got to talk about China. There was this big bet that we were going to see this post-pandemic boom coming out of China as pandemic restrictions were tapering off. Uh, that definitely did not come true. I want to take a look at the MSCI index down 13 percent year to date. A lot of issues when it came to the picture coming out of China, one of them being that we didn't really know the status of COVID-19 cases in the region. It's very difficult to get a clear picture of things on the ground from Beijing. Uh, also, the property market is kind of a mess right now in China. But that's one reason why my sources are telling me they think there's nowhere to go but up for China heading into next year. That's why we might be seeing the CSI index starting to creep up over the past couple of days as we head into the end of the year. So strategists have flipped from bearish to bullish uh, and they're still maintaining this China growth story.
And it's so fascinating, especially to your point, uh, Madison, about the recession calls for this year. There were yeah. so many uh, early in the year. So, you know, obviously that was one that was wrong. And now when you look at predictions for next year, in terms of any calls there, it's kind of like it's a coin toss. It's like 50-50 right. because people are like, oh, we got 2023 wrong. We might not want to stick our neck out there too far for 2024. Yeah, I mean, is it luck? Is it skill, right? right? You never know. You don't. All right, we'll put a pin in it for now. Maddie Mills, thank you. Thank you. All right, it is the final trading day of 2023, and as we prepare to end the year with a bang, we also have to set ourselves up for what could be a wild 2024, with geopolitical tensions showing no signs of cooling, a potentially contentious election on the horizon, and inflation remaining sticky. Our next guest has his eyes on the risks. We have Bob Elliott, Unlimited co-founder, CEO, and CIO with us. Now, Bob, one of the risks you cited is markets pricing in up to 7 rate cuts in 2024. So let's get your perspective on this. What are you expecting from the Fed? Are you in the seven camp? Well, I think the odds that we see that magnitude of cuts from the Fed uh, are pretty low. And and the reason why that is, is central banks move quickly to respond to growth slowdowns. They don't necessarily respond swiftly to inflation moderating uh, to around their target. And so a lot of the short rate market is expecting the Fed to see that lower inflation, that stabilizing inflation around 2% uh, and quickly cut in response when there really is no urgency. Uh, you know, for the, from the Fed's perspective, what they see is they see an unemployment rate at secular lows, they see growth above potential, and they see inflation that's around their mandate. And you put that all together there's no urgency to make any moves, let alone cut seven times. So, Bob, make it make sense for us here, because you would think if the Fed does end up having to cut, albeit I, I don't believe it'll be seven times, but if they do, what does that mean about what's happening in the economy that would have led them to cut seven times that the markets are not factoring in? Well, I think any time the Fed quickly cuts interest rates is a time you don't want to be holding stocks. And so I think there's a real disconnect between what we see priced in the stock market and what we see priced into the bond market right now. Stocks are pushing new highs, reflecting the fact that there's a strong set of liquidity conditions and the fall in long end rates is actually on the margin stimulative to the US economy. And then on the flip side, when you look at the bond market, uh, and particularly the short rate market, there's a greater than 30 percent chance uh, that short rates will be below 3 percent uh, in by the end of 2024, currently priced in. Those two things are totally out of whack. The only way in which we're going to see uh, interest rates get cut that rapidly is if we have a meaningful growth slowdown and a meaningful growth slowdown like that would be terrible for stocks. And so I, I think when you look at that mispricing, the imbalance of pricing uh, looks more incorrect on the bond market side than it does on the equity market side. We've seen a few swings of this over the course of the last couple of years where there's continually this expectation that the Fed's going to cut, the Fed's going to cut, the Fed's going to cut. But it never actually transpires because the economy ends up being meaningfully stronger than what people have expected. Bob, before we came to you, we were kind of talking uh, ahead of you about the things that uh, strategists, analysts got wrong for this year. One of those things was recession prediction. Uh, so how do you think, from what you're saying, basically, it looks like the bond market is, or the fixed income side of things, is predicting incorrectly what the Fed will do. Uh, so what's your expectation for what the economic backdrop will look like in 2024? Well, if you think about where we were uh, before the last eight weeks, we were seeing above potential growth, you know, re you know, some moderation from the relatively strong growth earlier in the year, but still doing pretty well when it came to the growth figures. Consumer demand was holding up, uh, you know, employment conditions continue to be relatively strong. And then in the last eight weeks, we've basically gotten uh, an effective 100 basis points of uh, interest rate cuts. Uh, on the long end, and we've got stocks up, you know, in double digits, both of which are highly stimulative to the economy. So if you look at that picture, all, you know, coming into that, a pretty good growth trajectory combined with additional stimulation, much more stimulation than was probably necessary for the economy. The odds that we go into a recessionary dynamic, say in the first half of 2024, are very low 
given that setup. So, Bob, given what the markets are telling us, the bond market and the Fed clearly saying, you know, don't get ahead of yourselves. How do you play this sort of market? How do you play the opportunities in this environment? Well, I think we're going to we're going back to an environment that looks a lot more like where we were at the beginning of 2023, uh, when there were a lot of expectations of very weak economic conditions, uh, which obviously didn't play out as was expected, and where the bond market, you know, the bond market today, basically looks like where we were back then, and uh, with expectations of a relatively swift move to cuts, I think we're going to see a, a replay in the beginning of this year similar to the re to what we saw in the beginning of 2023, where stocks outperform bonds and where the strength of the economy continues to get priced back in. And those interest rate cuts that are priced into December 2024, those are going to come out. Bond yields are going to move higher and stocks are going to hold up in that environment, given the strength that we're seeing. So it's a good time to be long stocks relative to bonds uh, and in particular short those short rates uh, in in the December 24 period. We'll have to see how all of that plays mm -hmm. out so far. It doesn't seem as, any, as if anyone's getting that right. I appreciate you joining us this morning, Bob Elliott, Unlimited co-founder, CEO and CIO. Thank you so much. All right, we're watching Lyft shares this morning, driven lower by a downgrade by Nomura from neutral to reduce. The analysts saying that the ride-hailing company's driver operating expenses are outpacing its earnings growth. A filing from December 28th also showed that Lyft's chief accounting officer had sold over 18,000 shares of the company. It's worth noting that Nomura also downgraded Uber as well. And really what's happening here is a lot of the upside that they see for this company already priced in and right. unlike Uber doesn't have the flexibility of things like Uber Eats, other levers that they can pull. So it, it is understandable. It, it doesn't have that. I mean, that's one of the concerns that has been around Lyft. I mean, look, it is a competitor to Uber, so that is what helps it have any kind of um, just any kind of substantive backing. I mean, you had Jeffries out with a note, uh, I believe it was last week. They were they have a hold on it. Uh, they did note the decline in ride share um, from over the past couple of years, from 2021 through 2023, uh, but they saw that that part of the Lyft story in order to gain further momentum is to maintain some sort of market share compared to Uber. Um, they've taken prices down to try to keep up with Uber. And again, to your point, Uber has that advantage of also having Uber Eats uh, and just has different verticals that help it. But it, when you look in terms of Uber share price today, it is getting dinged as well. Uh, just kind of it looks like a knock on effect from this uh, no out on a lift. I mean, but year to date, look, Uber's up more than 140 percent. So that one is uh, well positioned. One of the things that has been talked about with regard to Lyft is does it need to do some kind of deal to gain any more market share to really be competitive against an Uber? Like, does it need to do a tie up with DoorDash uh, or something like that to really, you know, just compete? Because right now you're looking at, yes, both stocks are being dinged today. Lyft, obviously, more than Uber. Um, but it's a far cry from where Uber stands in terms of share price. All right, we'll put a pen in that right now and see how these stocks do heading into the close, but we've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
crude oil is ticking slightly higher on the final trading day of 2023. The commodity is certainly having a roller coaster year, heading for its biggest annual drop since 2020. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is at the Interactive with the details. Hey, Jared. Hey, Rochelle, biggest drop in three years, but it's not a big one. About 6% here depends on how you measure it with the uh, futures contract rollover. Uh, but nevertheless, not a big deal as far as some of these other swings that we've seen, not the least of which was those huge gains we saw two years ago. Uh, but let's take a look at the price action for the year. This is our commodities heat map that we're looking at. Here's crude oil down 6%. And uh, just taking a look at the year to date, we are we have been in a $30 range, basically the mid 60s down here, all the way up to about the mid 90s down here, uh, if you count the intraday uh, highs and lows as well. Uh, but for the most part, the meat of the uh, the moves this year have been between about 65 and 80 thereabouts. Um, things that have been influencing the price of oil this year, well, what it wasn't was uh, China demand picking up. In fact, that was a huge disappointment, and that's based on a lot of the disappointment this year comes from the fact that China that reopening just did not go as planned. And then as a result, OPEC Plus has cut production. There are some fresh cuts uh, set to take, a plate, take place January 1st. Going to be a total of about 2.2 million barrels per day. That is a sizable amount. But Saudi Arabia has made rumblings that if they need to, if that price goes too low, they will support it. And another theory being thrown out there, um, less likely, is that Saudi Arabia may just clear the market. They may flood the market with supply uh, to to drive out of business some of the lower priced and some of the riskier businesses that operate in the sphere. Um, take a look at this five-year chart and you can see some much greater swings in years past. Here's this year right here, this small little rectangle. Here's the prior year and when we think about geopolitics, the Russian invasion of Ukraine had a much bigger effect on crude oil prices than we saw this year with the uh, Gaza and Israeli war. Um, that has probably not ended and we could see this flare up again in the next year. And if that's the case, we could see much higher prices. Uh, this high right here, I believe, was about $130 per barrel. And you consider where we've come from. Uh, we were printing negative 40, negative 40. Remember negative oil prices? That happened in 2020. Um, another thing we're looking for in the energy sector is potential M&A because this was a year, a huge year for announced deals. We had Exxon announcing a buy for Pioneer. We had Chevron putting in a bid for uh, uh, Hess. Both of, the, both of those deals were worth <coughs> more than $50 billion. So we could see some more jockeying for share of the Permian Basin. And global oil market is very competitive. And with the Saudis in the game cutting production, um, a lot of things could happen in the new year. All right. I know, indeed. A lot of things can happen in the new year. We'll be watching. Jared Blickery with the latest and greatest. All right. And what a year it has been for tech stocks. The so-called Magnificent Seven, that's Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Meta, Microsoft, and Tesla have dominated the S&P 500 this year as investors scooped up shares of mega cap tech names. Can these stocks continue to dominate in 2024? For a deeper dive into the tech sector, we're joined by Ray Wall on Constellation Research Principal Founder and Analyst. Ray, it's always great to talk to you. I love your commentary, whether you're with us or on social media, on the artist formerly known as Twitter. Always great insight. But so let's start out with the kind of broad headline. Can they continue to dominate in 2024? You know, and definitely, and happy Friday. Um, look, 12.1 trillion market cap from the doldrums of 8 trillion at the beginning of the year. The S&P was up 25% and two thirds of the gain were in these seven stocks. Now, these seven stocks also drove 39.5%. They were up 39% in revenues when the rest of the 493 stocks were down 2.3%. What's driving this? It's AI, it's the digital networks, it's their ability to continue to drive revenue growth in the double digits. And of course, the 10-year yield starting to come down is also driving the factor. So the winners here are really the companies that are able to actually continue, but there are also stocks outside the Magnificent Seven that are also gonna do well. Companies like Oracle, companies like Salesforce, NVIDIA, ServiceNow, that are gonna benefit not just from the AI boom, but also from the fundamentals of what digital giants have. So, Ray, you know I have to ask you about your Matana stocks. So, people who aren't familiar with the acronym, it's Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, Alphabet, NVIDIA, and Amazon. Given the push that AI is making and really changing some of the landscape here, any changes to that acronym, anyone perhaps who should be added or taken out of that list? 
They definitely should stay. And we saw the Mag7 got the X from which is Meta. And the reason Meta is, and Facebook is so important is because they're playing a crucial role in large language models with Llama. They've got some of the best language models and they're being seen as kind of the Switzerland for where AI is going to play in terms of how people design, build those models and actually look at model marketplaces. That's actually why Meta is in that mix. And so that's why we've gone from Matana to Mag7. And I think that's the big shift. Um, in addition, NVIDIA still got a great role Run. And I think a lot of folks don't realize there's still a shortage of GPUs, and that's playing a big role in terms of why NVIDIA stock is targeted at about 550 uh, in terms of where they'll be next year. And then the one that people haven't really been paying attention to really is Tesla. Tesla's got a lot of interesting AI technology sitting in the background, and you'll start to see that come into play as Elon expands his AI ambitions going forward into 2024. Ray, yes, yes. We've, we've talked about uh, Tesla's AI bot, um, but Tesla has a lot of challenges. So what is your expectation or what are you looking for for how Elon navigates that in 2024? You're totally right. There's a lot of challenges. And I think the big challenge is really the overall EV market. The demand is down. And so the question we have to ask is, are people down on EVs in general or are they down on Teslas? And I think most people realize that they think EV, they equate to Tesla, and it's the charging network that's giving them a boost. It's their fully integrated and automated vertical manufacturing capabilities from battery all the way to the actual delivery. Uh, and it's also the fact that they've got the ability to actually play also in the energy market. When you actually look at the Tesla, it's not just about the car, it's the energy network, it's the software, it's the insurance, and it's all the other business models. The other car makers do not have the additional business models. And Ray, of course, we're talking about clean energy here. I have to ask you about clean tech, and you've named it the biggest loser here. Break down your base case. Yeah, part of the reason clean tech is down, as you can see, the ESG funds are drying up. A number of the uh, ETFs are shut down. A number of the funds are shut down. And of course, governments are starting to realize the cost of actually achieving these goals may not necessarily achieve the benefits that they're trying to get to. And I think you could see that from the COP28 announcements that sustainability is giving away to business model realities. And we're starting to see those that don't bring green to green are actually not going to succeed. And then Ray, what are you looking for? There's a lot of expectation about the IPO market opening up. What are you looking for in the tech space, especially when you think about AI, uh, when it comes to public debuts next year? You know, there's a lot of great IPOs. We hit a massive drought in the last two years, only 148 IPOs, and the big one was ARM. That's really bad, but we're going to see a number of AI ones. I think the ones you're looking for, Databricks, they play a big role in enabling AI. You see OpenAI is going to try to get into the market, and of course, Scale AI are some of the plays that are there. But there are also other companies that, you know, we'll see where SpaceX goes, and we'll also see kind of the other ones like Shine and Stripe and other ones that have been waiting for the last couple of years. And in fact, not only have been waiting, they've actually been succeeding in what one have seen a down market and able to achieve double digit gains and revenue expectations. So it looks like 2024 could be an amazing IPO year. Certainly waiting for that catalyst to kick off. Always great to have you on. Ray Wong, Constellation Research Principal Analyst and Founder, and Happy New Year to you. Happy Friday, Happy New Year. All right, we have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning, Wall Street. Straight from Yahoo Finance's front page to your mobile phones and to your streaming apps. Watch our new flagship show, The Morning Brief. Your first stop as we guide you through the day's market action. We give you insights into the latest market moving news, real time analysis of today's top stories, and actionable information about your investments. We bring you the opening bell on Wall Street. And don't miss our strategy sessions with Wall Street's top analysts. It's The Morning Brief. It's The Morning Brief. The Morning Brief. Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief, empowering you to make smart investing decisions. Tune in daily at 9 a.m. Eastern.
It's been a roller coaster ride for the retail sector in 2023. Higher inflation rocked wallets as companies adjusted through price increases, but the discerning consumer remained largely resilient. Back in October, we spoke with Levi Strauss and co CFO Hamid Singh on the state of the consumer, which he called a tale of two worlds. It's a tale of two worlds. You have the um, you know the uh, low income to moderate in income consumer under pressure they have to take decisions uh, you know and they being a lot more discretionary you know our view is um, when they shop you know they want to shop with brands they can trust they want to shop with brands that are offering relevant products and uh, and so we bring that and brands that give good price value equation what we have done in in quarter 3 and it started being implemented by our uh, customers in the US, we took you know six of our 120 uh, fits, and we did reduce the prices to make it to make our uh, products um, uh, and our price value equation a lot more attractive. Uh, and then with innovation and the pipeline of newer products, I think that brings a lot more relevance. And so you know we're offering uh, you know to the consumer really what he or she wants, and that I think for brands like us that continue to grow market share. I, you know, will board well for the longer term. Well, the retail sector struggled heading into the holiday season with some warning signs flashing on difficult times ahead. Now, Target CEO Brian Cornell was one of several leaders in the space to give a cautious outlook, warning of a slowdown in consumer spending as people grappled with higher prices during the usually busy time of year. In November, we spoke with Walmart CFO John David Rainey about how his company was handling high inflation. When we talk about relief on the consumer, I think the first thing that we need to talk about is inflation. We've seen high inflation for two years now. When we look at the month of October, broadly across the categories of our business, inflation is about 2%, so much better than what it was. And you actually have to look at that by category to really understand what's happening. So food and consumables tend to be in that 2 to 4% range. General merchandise is actually, we've seen a pretty sharp drop off just in the last couple of weeks, where that is deflating year over year. So prices are less than where they were a year ago. It actually getting pretty close to where they were two years ago. And so what the impact that that's had on the consumer is they've had less money, their wallets have been stretched more thinly because of higher prices. And so they've focused on those things that they need versus the things that they want. And so as that pertains to the period of time that we're going into right now, the holiday shopping period, they're, they're waiting for these holiday specials, for these big events to buy those bigger ticket items, those TVs, those homes and elect, the home and electronic type categories that uh, we're seeing stronger spending in. But I think everything else said, like, we want to see lower prices. That's good for our customers. We want to be able to pass that along to them. And I think the consumer needs some relief right now. Well, despite some difficult times for the sector, one bright spot was Abercrombie & Fitch. The retailer raised its four-year guidance and touted an encouraging start to its holiday shopping season on the back end of its third quarter earnings report in November. We spoke to the CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch, Fran Horowitz, on why her company is seeing so much success. The consumer has an opportunity, you know, the consumer has a choice on where to shop and they're choosing us because the product, the voice, the experience is what they're looking for. And that's a result of staying close to the customer and really understanding what, what they want. Really importantly though, Brian, this lesson that we learned from COVID about keeping our inventories lean is really, really paying off. Our inventories are clean. They are a result of testing and learning and the supply chain being back on target and being able to be fluid is really a big win for us. We built a muscle into our sourcing and our, um, and our, into our logistics team that's really driving, helping us drive the business. Pre-COVID, I think the retailers chased every last sale, and there was a lot of sales that were just not profitable and you didn't want to have them. And today, it's much more important to stay lean and make sure you have the right assortment in your, in, in, in your inventory. When we decided many, many years ago, as you were on that journey with me, that we could decide whether we were going to have one, way back, right, was it one brand or two? And we realized that we could make Hollister the iconic global teen brand and age Abercrombie up into this young millennial brand where there was a big white space in the market. So the teams are focused on the 25 plus, maybe 25 to 30 for merchandising, marketing, et cetera. But those that are shopping with us go way beyond that. And they're very excited about the fact that we have diversity in, in sizing and in, in fabrications and categories. And that's what they're responding to. 
And Diane, as we hear from a lot of the, the retail leaders there, it really does speak to this, this change that we're seeing in the more discerning consumer. We saw that perhaps they weren't as willing to spend on big ticket items, but they were willing to spend on experiences and some certain types of goods. You hate to think that a lot of this increased spending was a result of inflation, but we know some of that was. But we have seen inflation continue to tamp down, but we're still... You know, seeing those expectations of waiting yeah. for the consumer to break under the pressure, still not happening, still I resilient, know. not robust, but resilient. No, I mean, look, we've heard analysts after analysts, economists after economists say never underestimate the American consumer. I mean, look, we like to spend. You've been here long enough to know, Rochelle. <laughs> and look, when you look at also even the share price of each of these companies, though, it goes to show uh, who was positioned well and who could handle just the consumer continuing all three of those, uh, the share prices of those companies, of those executives that we talked to are actually higher for the year. But the standout is Abercrombie & Fitch. That stock has soared this year. Who would have thought it? I mean, it's up more than 200%. Yes, down on the day, but it's up. I mean, clearly some investors uh, taking some gains uh, there, but up more than 200% uh, year to date, more than 250% year to date. I mean, huge, strong performance, best performance in decades for this company. So uh, what Fran has done in terms of changing the inventory, the look of Abercrombie & Fitch, uh, and, you know, just targeting the type of shopper that comes in there has really, really paid off for both the company and for investors in that company. Uh, I want to do a quick mention of Walmart. That stock is up around 10% year to date, so it's certainly holding up. Uh, and it just goes to show about like it is a retailer that is well positioned to handle a more discretionary consumer when you think about what their uh, inventory is. I mean, look, grocery is a huge part of its offerings. and and consumers continue to, to turn there. We know earlier in the year and even uh, I think as far back as late last year, you had uh, people who earned six figures starting to turn to Walmart. And that's where Target started to face some challenges because, look, only about a fifth of its uh, revenue comes from grocery. It doesn't have as big of a grocery offering. So Walmart uh, positioned well there. And one thing we didn't get to, Rochelle, in our chat is, of course, one theme that we've talked about throughout the year is kind of, kind of quiet, shrink that being a problem for oh, yes. retail. In, indeed. I want to say shrink and also better inventory mm -hmm. management, though, because I know that when you think of where we were in the pandemic, now you saw that because, you know, uh, retailers had a better handle on inventory, they didn't discount as deeply during this holiday season. Because I saw that I wasn't seeing the yeah. bargains to the extent that I was expecting. But I guess now they're in a position where they can afford to do that. So yeah. we'll see how that plays out for the consumer. Indeed. Heading and charge people for returns. I, you know, that's yes. an interesting that's it starting hurts. to happen this year. Hang on a second. We didn't have this before. All right, switching gears. Pandemic darlings have had a rocky past few years. Uh, well, back in 2021, actually, the times were good for them. Peloton, Carvana, Wayfair, and Chewy had a collective market capitalization of over $160 billion as they rode the high of the stay-at-home consumer. But since then, interest has certainly tapered off with web visits and share prices falling far below the highs of 2020. I mean, many of these companies with, you know, we want to pull out Chewy from kind of that conversation, went from pandemic darlings to duds when you think about where they are, were and are now. I mean, you look at Peloton today, Rochelle, that is around six bucks a share today. And I mean, at its peak, it was a uh, triple digit stock. Look at that. I mean, all of those under some pressure today. We are seeing some drift in the market in general today. But look at that and think about where they were, Rochelle. I think it's a story of sort of failure to future proof. We knew we mm -hmm. were in the pandemic. We didn't know how long we were going to be in it, but we knew that people weren't going to be staying home forever <laughs> on Pelotons. And then when you mm -hmm. think of the price point as well, it just, they didn't have enough of a moat to make it something where people would want to, you know, keep buying it. I, for one, I let everyone know I returned mine because I was like, yeah, I'll stay at home and work out. I don't even like working out. Why did I buy a Peloton? <laughs> so, there was a, so there was some of that. But then when you look at a company like Carvana, which still has a lot of room to run. People are still going to be buying cars. It put them in a better position. People are still going to be buying for their pets as well, which is why Chewy is still doing well. But Peloton, I think, did not think far enough mm -mm. about beyond the pandemic as to where that growth would come from, unfortunately. Indeed. We'll have, to, we'll have to leave that there for now, but we still have all your markets action ahead. So stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Move over, chat GPT. The AI battle is heating up. China's Baidu saying its AI bot now tops 100 million users at a summit in Beijing. The latest development sending the stock higher this week. It's Ernie Bot, that's what it's dubbed, was released to the public in late August. Now, Baidu's chat bot is part of a larger strategy to expand its AI plays. And this is a milestone for uh, Baidu this week with regard to its AI strategy and increasing. And look, it is certainly playing catch up. Uh, Rochelle, when you think about uh, chat GPT and it being more than a year on the market and the fast adoption of that. Uh, so again, this milestone that the Ernie bot is hitting. I mean, what a funny name to me uh, for its uh, AI chat bot, uh, you know, but and you think about right now, there is some potential for it to gain more momentum compared to chat GPT when we certainly know the speed bump that chat GPT faced this week with regard to that lawsuit uh, from the New York Times, which uh, said that open AI infringed on its uh, on its um, on its IP. Indeed. I mean, so I, I think at some point the Ernie bot's going to face the same sort of challenges. And right now, I, I believe we're at the Ernie 4 uh, rendition of it now, just as you have chat GPT mm -hmm. 4 as well. Um, we saw that Baidu CEO Robin Lee said that Baidu itself, the company, will be collecting massive real world human information and feedback and then use that to help fuel the information that they will use for Ernie and Baidu's foundation models and seeing improvements in comprehension, reasoning, memory generation, using these algorithms. But again, it did race to the top of the, the app store in China because it was free. But then you have to wonder, as we see more of these lawsuits, more of these infringement um, lawsuits popping up, whether or not the only bot will, will be subject to the same sort of scrutiny. Obviously, a different model in China as to what we see over here. But perhaps as we still wait to see more sort of international regulation on AI and how it's right. sourcing some of this data, Perhaps we'll see some momentum there. And if that's reached, perhaps that will sort of level the playing ground here. But an interesting development here. We'll wait till we get, I guess, more information on just how far Ernie could go. Indeed. Indeed. I know. And it's, we'll see if there's a BERT competitor. I'm sorry. I had to do it. <laughs> All good. <laughs> All good. All right. Well, staying in the AI lane, it's showing no signs of slowing down, but is regulation on the horizon in the new year? Our next guest expects the government to rush regulation leading to ineffective policies. For more on this, we have Matt Culkins, Appian founder and CEO. Thank you for joining us back on the show here at Yahoo Finance. So as we, we've seen this sort of piecemeal approach by some states when it comes to trying to cap sort of AI regulation here. But where are we in this space and how might that perhaps muddy the waters heading into 2024? It's great to be here. We're at a crossroads in AI regulation with every continent taking their own direction, expressing their own priorities. I think you were right just a moment ago to say that the number one issue in AI regulation is fair use, at least in the United States, it's fair use, which is to say, is AI's right to train on copyrighted information stronger than individuals right to their own privacy and intellectual property. Uh, there's lawsuits, you mentioned the New York Times, we've got lawsuits from musicians, from artists, from authors. It's a major, it's gonna be a major battleground in 2024. You've seen Europe fire the first shot here and, and request that AI disclose the data on which its algorithms are, tra are trained upon. I think that would bring public attention and make people realize just how much the intelligence of artificial intelligence is drawn from, from copyrighted human material. So far, the U.S. hasn't been willing to make a stand like that, though I'd like to see them make one. So, Matt, how do you balance uh, the concerns about privacy uh, and protections and kind of data protection with innovation? You're right. You're right. There would be a little bit of a break on innovation if we precluded AI from using copyrighted information. They would have to go out and compensate the copyright owners for use of that information. And in some cases, they might not choose to do so. But I believe that that's fair. I believe that if you create something, you have a right to the thing you created. And so we should respect the authors, the artists, the musicians, the creators, even if it does slow down the progress of AI just a little bit. By the way, Baidu and others are going to face a different kind of a break. Uh, in China, AI is regulated based on what the output can be. Right, They're kind of the opposite of the way that I would prefer to regulate it. But there's going to be some different regulation zones, and every AI innovator is going to face hurdles. They just won't be the same ones. 
And so then obviously AI has been all the talk so far this year. As we head into 2024, and sort of, you know, a lot of investors are going to be wanting to see, you know, for all this AI talk that came up in earnings calls, where are the use cases? Where do we actually see these companies using this? How much is that going to dominate the conversation in 2024? Uh, that is the conversation in 2024. In 2023, you could be a leader in AI just by talking a good game. And we've had a lot of people out there competing to say the most hyperbolic things about AI. But in 2024, the conversation will shift. It's going to be about what you've accomplished what you can actually deliver, the value you've created, the, the, the implementations you've done. I think that there's a wraith out now between organizations as to which can show that they're benefici benefiting from AI and, and for, for that matter, amongst professionals, showing that they can master this new technology that is the future. Uh, my advice to any of those organizations or people would be start with something simple, start with something that you can achieve briefly with a rudimentary implementation of AI and use that as a stepping stone to build your skills and raise your reputation. I think that we should move incrementally on AI, but, but make no mistake, it's a different conversation in 2024. It's about what you've accomplished, not what you can forecast. So Matt, one of the questions also that has been hanging around AI over the past year is, is it an antagonist or protagonist kind of in this uh, fast moving world of technology? And I often ask uh, people in this space, is it friend or foe, especially with the direction uh, it's going in 2024? Will it work with people and workers or is it just going to replace all of us? It's, it's going to be a compliment. It'll be a member of our team, but it's not going to replace us. And I'm, I'm glad to see that realization shifting and spreading throughout the economy. AI didn't take our job in 2023, and it's not going to take it in 2024 either. It's going to make us stronger at doing our work. It's going to empower us to do more. AI is going to be a tool that we can use to uh, to have a you know to, to be faster, to be better at synthesis to be uh, to be more effective and faster and understand our data better than we understood it in the past. But I think in 2024, we're going to find that our fears about AI were overblown. And in fact, it's a great compliment and a team member. And particularly for those of us who can who can figure out how to use it to 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 gain uh, to gain some benefit, it's going to be an explosive career enhancer and and an asset. And Matt, speaking of not being able to be replaced, we have to talk about Sam Altman and really what that what that unfolding of what happened with him leaving, you know, heading off, coming back. How does this position him in terms of being this this really this face of generative AI and regulators perhaps looking to him for some guidance? You have the industry wants to regulate itself. How do you see his position and how all that played out affecting how investors look at AI? <sighs> Well, I think that investors can't help but see this and think that if this is the, the, the most organized, this is the citadel of AI, right? The, the innovator, the most famous organization, and you see this kind of a clash between the board and the CEO and this kind of politics, you've got to worry a little bit. You've got to realize that behind the mysterious curtain, right, there is no wizard in AI. There, there is no... Uh, there is no absolutely solid, reliable organization in this industry. We're all experimenting. We're all learning. We're all on the cutting edge. And uh, you could see how much Sam was valued by his employees. But you can also see the instability of governance. And, and, and I think that the reflection I take away from this is there, there's nobody out there who is so reliable that we can just say, how about you protect us from AI? How about you? How about we just trust you to be sure that AI is safe? I think we've got to realize that there's no institution capable of doing that. And we've all got to be thinking about AI and and considering for ourselves what best ways to to limit the, uh, the downside of all the technology. Right. All right. There is no wizard in AI. All right. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us, Matt Calkins, Appian founder and CEO. We appreciate you for your time and happy new year. Thanks, you too. All right. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, as we wrap up things here, we wanted to bring you our take on the big stories that we're across in the coming year. So for me, it's the labor market. What will be the impact of the Fed's so-called dovish pivot on wages, layoffs, and that other big story that mm -hmm. we've been across all year, unions? So quite a bit to break down here. Um, in terms of the number of strikes, though, I want to start with the unions. Uh, according to Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations, 500,000 workers went on strike this year. That's triple the same amount versus a year ago. And we've even seen that really spill over into non-union companies. Like we thought right. Tesla was going to be spared from the auto workers strike. But then in Sweden and other places, they're like, well, hey, you know, we're seeing these other companies get the benefits here. And even we saw companies like Honda raising their wages as well. Of course, you have the Hollywood strike as well, and that was about really sort of future-proofing industries as well, as well as making up for some of the changes they didn't anticipate. AI and streaming as well. You had healthcare workers right. also on strike. And something else that I thought was interesting, as we look at the potential for layoffs, according to Resume Builder, which is a professional platform, mm. nearly four in 10 companies said they're likely to have layoffs in 2024. Interestingly, more than half of them planning a hiring freeze in 2024. So... It plays into that narrative of, you know, at one point, the workers had all the power, but now you have a tighter labor market. You have yep. the Fed potentially at some point pivoting. And if that unemployment rate goes up, it really does shift that dynamic. And I think people aren't really pricing that in and preparing for it. Yeah, and I mean, we'll certainly see that next week. We know the job market is going to be a big focus next week. We have the jobs report coming up, expecting to see some cooling in terms of jobs added, expectations around 100,000. We'll see if that... I mean, of course, uh, predictions start to change as we get closer, and the unemployment rate is expected to tick up a little bit. We'll see where that stands. Another thing I'm watching in terms of 2024, we would be remiss if we didn't mention, of course, the election. It's going to be a big election year, not just for the U.S., but across the globe. But in terms of the U.S., how will the ramp up to next year's presidential vote impact the stock market, the U.S. dollar, and your portfolio? What could it kind of impact could we see from AI and misinformation? I mean, that's, of course, been one of the big themes we've talked about this year in terms of the market impact. I mean, in an election year, it honestly doesn't really matter who actually wins in terms of the market impact. The market tends to rally. It tends to be a smaller rally, but the bullishness uh, expected to just really continue next year. Uh, there's some data I got from LPL Financial. Uh, the S&P 500 has generated an average gain of 7 percent during during a presidential election year. Uh, so it's not as high as the average gain overall, but a gain no less. The, econ the economy in the U.S. tends to grow on average no matter who's in office, but their policies matter. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of what the economic, could there be another shooter drop? Not expected. No matter whether it's, you know, as it stands, it looks like it'll be a Biden-Trump rematch. We'll see if that's where things end up. We'll know more, obviously, in January after the caucuses. And the misinformation campaign, will that mm -hmm. accelerate during a presidential year? How will that impact both the election and markets? It's true. And honestly, I think Main Street's probably more worried than Wall Street. Wall Street's like, yeah, we do this every four years. We, mm -hmm. we can roll with it. I think Main Street, we're already exhausted, and we haven't even right. hit 2024 yet. When we think about the elections, the lawsuits, a lot of vitriol, and then we have to wonder about misinformation as well. Well, at least for now, we don't have to worry about it. A quick check of the market, still red across the board, at least heading into this noon hour. That does it for myself, Rochelle Akufo, alongside Diane King-Hall. Thank you for watching us this year. We'll see you in 2024. Happy, Happy New Year. year.